How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're going to be here for the next two hours talking pro wrestling. Guest today will be Jeff Merrick of Live Audio Wrestling, so this will be a fun show. Canada's, probably Canada's leading authority on pro wrestling. And, of course, we have Brian Alvarez of Figure Four here tonight. And, uh, Brian, are you tired? Yes, I am, actually. Oh, How did I, I you just know predicted, that? I, I just figured, well, Tuesday night, I mean, Wednesdays, you know what I mean? It's, yeah. I know it's, it's hard for you as it's going to be for me, and, and I was up pretty late last night. Finishing yeah. Yeah. Um, any, uh, anything as far as in the issue? Uh, uh, just wrote a big, long thing. I started doing the, uh, story on WCW, and I was just, you know, basically writing about what's going on, and it's like, throughout the night, it's like, I didn't even know what to write. Do I write, it's more likely that it's going to be shut down? Do I write, it's more likely that it's not going to be shut down? You know, and it's like, I ended up writing about both. Well, it's going to be, it's going to yeah. be... It's going to be one or the other. It's going to be shut down temporarily one way or the other. Yeah, yeah. I'm, so. I mean, I'm not 100% on that, but I'm pretty confident you can say that. The conclusion I came to was it's going to be shut down, and it's either going to be a transitional period or permanent. And that actually um, revealed absolutely no news whatsoever, but it was something to write about. So did a big, long thing on that, and uh, Lionel Tate, just a bunch of stuff. And uh, You know, the one thing, the one thing in the Lionel Tate thing that I read last week that got very little publicity is, you remember that the the whole thing about how we were always discussing whether, whether like, the injuries that he gave this girl could have been from wrestling moves or not from wrestling moves? Yeah. Okay. Um, and, 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 you know, I mean, that's such a weird, it's like a weird thing because it's like pretty much anything can be constituted as a wrestling move that, he, that you would do to inflict bodily harm on someone else. Yeah, that's the whole you, thing. You know, it's, like, it's, it's not necessarily... It is, doesn't say you learned it from wrestling, but it does say. But pretty much anything you could do to hurt someone, dropping an elbow, dropping a knee, I mean, it could be called a wrestling move. It's been done in wrestling, right? Yeah, I mean, what has not been. I mean, they joke about it all the time. You know, he used everything with a kitchen sink, and then Raven uses a kitchen sink. And it's like, what can you actually do to a human being that at some point in the history of wrestling has not been done to another person? I know, we can't even say, like, throw her out, off of a third story window because we've uh, seen that too. Yeah, throw her off Cobo Hall. Uh, yeah, but but the thing is, which I found... Run someone over with a car? Next time someone gets hit by a car, is that going to be, like, uh, inspired by wrestling? <laughs> Next time someone no, I... uh, pushes someone's car off the balcony or a ledge or something like that, is that wrestling? No, but, but then, but then, but, but at the same time, okay? It's not, you know, I mean, if someone gets, if someone runs someone over by a car, it's pretty weak to say it was inspired by wrestling. And, and I don't think few people, I don't think, I think few people would actually say that, but... At the same time, wrestling cannot defend it and say it, and say that we don't do this when they do. Do you yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. I mean, it's like it's like uh, it's like it's, it's sort of like that the Jerry McDivitt thing of uh, like the injuries he sustained could not have been from wrestling moves, and it's like, well, they probably really were. Uh -huh. I mean, that's not to say that wrestling's at fault. And and even if, you know, even if he was and again, and even if he was inspired by wrestling, I mean, it's certainly not a defense in a court to me. I mean, and I've had people argue with me about that one, but I don't believe that it should be. But but the WWF or, or anyone can't say he did not use wrestling moves. And and one of the reasons, which scared me, I actually wrote about this um, in, in this week's Observer, was that the judge uh, said that, like, I guess the expert that testified basically felt that her injuries were, that, that she was on the ground, and he was, to use a wrestling phrase, although he didn't know this phrase, he was doing the wrestling move known as stomping a mud, a mud hole into her, which mm -hmm. is something Steve Austin does in every single match. Yeah. You know, basically he's on the ground and stomping her and stomping her, and then the judge, one of the reasons, he, you know, that, that he threw this out, and I'm reading this, I'm going like, oh, my God. You know what I mean? It's like, it's like granted, I don't think that, again, wrestling should have probably never been in this trial at all because it was just a murder and... and whether you're inspired by wrestling or inspired by a movie or inspired by your own fantasy, if you kill someone, you, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, you're I, I just don't know no that you can, Yeah, you're wrong. For it. I don't happened. think that you can. I, I don't think you can say, blame something that you watch on television for doing that. Well, anyway, he threw it out because he said that nowhere in wrestling has he ever heard of where someone stomps on someone on the ground and stomps on someone who's half their size. And I was just thinking, like, I just like threw my pencil in the air and I go, oh my god. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. It's like actually that happens in wrestling all the time. Yeah. So it was like oh boy, it was kind of like that thing. Uh, I don't know. Sometimes I'll read stuff in articles where some someone's like discussing wrestling. Uh, you know, like uh, 
the commission fight in Georgia from last week, which I also mm. wrote about that too, uh, in the commission fight where the legislators going like, you know, they they have this argument, and I mean, you just throw, you know, it's like, you know, the the, the guy who's introducing the bill goes, um, you know, we've heard rumors that people occasionally get hurt <laughs> doing this stuff. You know what I mean? Yeah. And I'm going like, oh, well, at least do your research. Yeah. And then the other, on the other hand, then we had, you know, the wrestling promoter saying, actually, no one ever gets hurt. And I was going like, but great. Which is stupid. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm when, going when like, When you're lying great, you about know? something like that, you're just setting yourself up. And I don't feel sorry. I don't feel sorry for any promoter who says something like that and then gets caught in a lie and something happens to them, like their show gets shut down. I don't feel sorry at all. Why lie about No, I don't, I, 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 I don't either. Because, you know, you, know, this, uh, you know, like to go in there and say, like, you know, um, that, you know, like, nobody actually ever gets hurt doing this. We're, we're just, you know, we're not even, um, well, I mean, there was a terminology. Ron, Ron West said, like, we're, we're not even professional wrestlers where, um, I forget what the word is. Do I have the word here? I don't have the word. But he just goes, we're not even professional wrestlers. We're, like, entertainers. And I'm just thinking, like, um, actually, you are professional wrestlers, yeah. <laughs> which are entertainers. Yeah. But don't say you're not professional wrestlers. It's like, come on, you know. Anyway, exactly. Um... We should probably... I'm still trying to figure out... I mean, I was reading about the whole Lionel Tate thing, and I think, uh, you know, there have been many articles where, where like, uh, the lawyers have said, you know, the kid... The lawyers. He didn't really know that he was going to kill this girl. He didn't mean to kill her or whatever, blah, blah, blah. And I'm still trying to figure out, why wasn't he charged with manslaughter? Uh, because of the feeling that while it wasn't premeditated, that while he was doing it, the injuries were so severe that he didn't mean to kill her. Because he wouldn't have done as much as he did, much damage. I mean, it wasn't like he woke up premeditated. Because it was charged as a premeditated. I guess that the idea is is that while you're doing it, if you're thinking about doing it, um, you know, an accident. Oh, you know, I for, see. Okay, yeah, yeah. He, while he's doing it, it's premeditated. I mean, it's not like he woke up that morning and says, later today I'm going to do it. But it's like while you're beating this person, instead of stopping, you're going like, you know, I'm going to beat this person until she's lifeless. Yeah. Uh, you know, you know. So I, I think that was the reason it was charged with first degree okay. instead of second degree. And then, then this, this other strange part is, is that in that case, I don't want to get too long in that case, but in that case was that the prosecutor, after getting the conviction for first degree, and then the judge sentences to life without parole, the prosecutor comes back and just goes, you know, we didn't really mean to charge him with that. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Yeah. Because we, you know, because uh, because even the prosecutor thought that the punishment was too strong, and 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 is actually petitioning the governor of Florida, you know, uh, Jeb Bush to lower the punishment. And this is the guy who, who charged him on that crime. Yeah. Going like, well, we didn't charge him with second degree because the crime meant first degree, but at the same time, we didn't mean for him to be sentenced like a first degree murderer. Yeah. So, I mean, which I guess I, I, I do sort of understand. It's just, what it can I say about it? Uh, okay, it's um, our system. Our system's very bad. Yeah. I mean, I don't, turning, not that I have a better one. But just, turning it, down it just a, is. a plea bargain offer. The plea bargain offer where he would have spent no time in prison. He would have spent yeah. three years in juvenile detention, ten years probation. And they turned it down to go to trial because Lewis, who scares me to death, by the way, I mean, just, I, I certainly don't want him as my lawyer. Lewis thought he could, he could win the case. And it's like, all the evidence is against you, and you're going to go in, and your big defense is, is this guy watched, you know, Sting in a TV commercial that the judge immediately threw out, and that's your defense of getting him off instead of a plea bargain where, you know, he gets three years juvenile detention. I mean, come on. That, that's, they, they, I mean, for someone who did that to someone else, um, I mean, the three years juvenile detention, to me, that's too little. No, yeah, life in yeah. prison without possibility of parole for a 12-year-old is, is, is scary. But that's, hey, guys, I don't mean to jump yeah. in for a minute. We had a listener just call in. Apparently, he was charged, Lionel Tate, with, with felony murder, so there's a big difference in the, in the plea bargaining issue. There's, in, there's not in, as much leeway. So... Uh, apparently, I guess. Well, first, it was it was it was first degree. I mean, as far as leeway in the sentencing. Yeah. Um. Yeah, but that, that's been the, the prosecutors trying to get the sentencing down. Yeah, I mean, they could have accepted the plea. The, the mother could have accepted the plea bargain in the beginning, and, and the, he could have been. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. We know that. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But and I, they I, they didn't. I guess the way they had had you know given the charges, there was no way to, to just to drop it to a manslaughter plea. Apparently, that he was charged with first degree murder. No, no. Once he was convicted, uh, once he was convicted, they couldn't um, sentence him to a second degree murder because he was convicted of first degree. Mm -hmm. But they probably could have like given him parole. I mean, because because everyone was shocked at the sentence. I mean, it was going to be a steep sentence because he was convicted. But no, the the steepness of the sentence was like the the big issue. 
So, anyway, you want to go to the Arrowhead Pond last night for SmackDown? Sure, except I have no idea what happened. Okay, well, I will tell you. I what don't happened. know a thing. You don't know? Okay. Um, in, for Sunday Night Heat this Sunday, Crash Holly wins the light heavyweight title from Dean Malenko. Uh, Dean Malenko kisses Molly. So, got a new girlfriend, new or a new girl he's chasing. And um, Molly then tacked Dean, and it allowed Crash to get a ro roll up on, on him for the pin. And they also had a Raven Valvinus match where Steven Richards came out and did a Steven kick to Valvinus by accident, and he got pinned. And Valvinus and Steven, you know, started fighting, but Ivory smoothed things over. They're doing this RTC breakup, I guess, probably for WrestleMania, it looks like, because they're sure teasing yeah. it now. Hey, I got a question. Yes. You didn't watch Heat, did you? So, yeah, he, uh, I watched about five minutes of it later. Did you see uh, the part where Ninja Chick got unmasked? No, I didn't. If anybody saw that show, uh, call in and let us know what happened, because I want to know if it was like uh, one of the Lucha deals where she was unmasked, but... You know, the cameras didn't catch who it was, but ringside fans did, because it was weird on Monday. They had the, uh, they had the hardcore match with, or Raven was out there, and they, they just before that match showed clips from Heat, and then Raven comes out, and you'd think that they would acknowledge that the, uh, ninja had her mask removed, and they made no mention of it whatsoever. They just go, oh, his ninja's just... not here tonight. And I thought, that's kind of weird. Why would they, why would they not even mention that if they just showed Heat clips? No, that whole thing was very strange to me that she wasn't there at all, because I thought that, you know... I mean, what was the point of having her, once she was unmasked, that was going to be... Obviously, they have new ideas. I guess so. For, yeah, for, for SmackDown, Test Beat, Eddie Guerrero, uh, Perry Saturn and Chris Jericho both interfered. Obviously, Jericho's interference was uh, a little more effective, because he nailed Eddie Guerrero and Test won with a big, with a big scary boot. Um, Jim Ross did an interview with Steve Austin, talking about his match with Kurt Angle and later with The Rock. Uh, Undertaker was stalking the parking lot, waiting for Triple H to arrive with a lead pipe. So he's trying to do Goldberg. Uh, let's see. The Hardys and Billy Gunn, no contest with X-Pac, Albert, and Just Incredible. Uh, Regal came out and tried to reason with The Undertaker, which probably is going to be really funny. But The Undertaker <laughs> scared him off, and he ran away. Then uh, Hunter and Stephanie showed up in the limo, and The Undertaker started smashing the limo with the pipe. Luckily, not with his fist. Thank God. Well, at least someone. And um, the police arrested Undertaker, and while he was being taken away, Hunter got a sucker punch in. So, a uh, little bit and of And, of that. course, was not arrested. I always love that. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> and then it was revealed that it was Steve Regal who called the police. So, uh, let's see. Then uh, Dudley's beat uh, Chris Jericho in a handicap match, so Regal's still screwing with Jericho. Uh, 3D through a table. It's a tables match, too. Um... Kane demanded a match with Triple H, which, of course, he lost. Uh, anyway. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, he did, really. Um, so, uh, let's see. Uh, 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 Grandmaster Sexay had a match with RTC, but he needed a partner because, uh, you know, Scotty Too Hot, he's injured. So Steve Blackman came in and said that he would team with Grandmaster Sexay as long as he kept his mouth shut in the dressing room. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of a funny one. Uh, let's see. Uh, so anyway, Blackman and Grandmaster Sexay beat uh, Bull and the Good Father. Uh, again, the uh, Good Father's teasing the turn. The crowd's chanting, we want hoes. The Good Father's looking around like he wants to, to do it. It ends up, obviously this script, uh, you know, usually the scripts are done like the Thursday before. Obviously they went to a Jerry Lawler script, you know, to that long-term script for this angle, where uh -huh. it was going. Because the finish was that uh, Steve Richards, Stephen Richards tried to interfere, and Taz jumped out of the announcer's chair and attacked Stephen Richards and uh, also uh, attacked uh, Bull Buchanan, and he got pinned. So I guess... <laughs> was Taz wearing a crown? <laughs> they didn't go that far. That wasn't in the storyline? Okay. No. And, and, but it uh, was Steve Taz Black and Michael Cole, though, huh? Yeah. Okay. Uh, and uh, Steve Blackman does, in fact, dance after the match. Oh, my God. Yeah, I thought Triple that's what he would have told him is, I'll do this, but I ain't dancing. <laughs> yeah. Triple H beat Kane with a pedigree with the interference from the big show. And then Big Show chokeslam Kane after the match. And the main event is Austin and Angle in an ODQ. And uh, Angle gets the ankle lock. Let's see. Rock is doing the announcing. And Rock and Austin uh, collide, I think, twice. Um, let me see. Yeah, they, they, they collide two different times. Um, Angle hit Rock with a chair at one point. Angle put the ankle lock on Austin, but Rock, recovering from the chair shot, ran and interfered. Uh, he went to Rock, Rock went to Rock Bottom Austin. But Angle attacked Rock, so Rock instead Rock bottomed Angle. Austin then stunned Rock and pinned Angle. Then uh, after Austin left, 
Angle attacked Rock, but Rock uh, laid him out with a people's elbow. So that's the situation Sucks there. Sucks to be and, uh, Angle. What? Sucks to be Angle. Hey, he's getting the biggest. He's getting a big push now. He got the ankle lock on. Uh, he had he had Austin and Rock both beat. Well, there you go. Huh? Did Austin tap? I do not know, and I guess we'll find out. I um, highly doubt it. I bet I was going to bet no on that one myself. I didn't hear how, if that match was good, but uh, a lot of the WWF matches lately have been. So uh, let's see. In fact, poll question uh, for today: uh, What was the best Raw match this year? I got A. Steve Austin against Kurt Angle. B. Rock against that was uh, from a couple. Several weeks ago, actually. Rock against Kurt Angle, which was from Monday. Eddie Guerrero against... I wrote Chris Jericho. Al, switch that to Chris Benoit. You got it. Guerrero. I meant Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit from Monday. And then D, Rock and Austin against Benoit and Angle. So anyway, that's the um, poll question. And the results of yesterday's poll question... Where are those results? Here? By the way, for everybody that uh, has been emailing, which has actually been one person, uh, the Wrestling Observer poll will be switched again... Very, very soon. I'm uh, way behind on the website because uh, actually I actually did so much feedback this weekend that I got behind on everything else. So uh, that's the story there. Okay. Uh, the poll for uh, Monday Night's Wrestling, 63% thought Raw was better, which is a lot better number than it's been getting lately. Um, probably because it was a lot better show than it's been. 6% thought Nitro was better. 1% didn't watch Raw. 18% didn't watch Nitro. And only 12% didn't watch Raw or Nitro. So at least the, the, the viewership... Of uh, raw from the readers, the listeners actually seems uh, back to normal. Uh, let's see. The Ken Shamrock will not be on the show on Friday, and I don't have all the details of it. Uh, Ken Shamrock has some sort of a neck vertebrae injury, um, and I don't know any more about it than that. Um, I, they're they're not saying anything about how that affects the fight on the 25th if he's in or he's out or what's going on, um, and I don't even think that they want the injury out, but, but there is a neck vertebrae injury there, so it's out. And um, good job. Yeah. And uh, let's see. We'll probably we'll probably hear more about that tomorrow. And let me see the uh, XFL numbers. Uh, we the Did uh, people out of the, the show because they didn't want to talk about it, or oh no, I don't know. Um, um, I, I'm actually I'm presuming that yes, okay. or maybe for, may, maybe he's getting treatment, you know, so he can yeah, because we can fight next week. Yeah. I don't know. Man, that is scary, though. I mean, I wouldn't want to fight... Well, I wouldn't want to fight that guy with a gun, but that's another story. But I wouldn't want to fight Igor Vovchanchin any less than 100%. Yes. Yeah. Um, we'll I, I guess we'll find... I mean, sooner we're going to find something out in the next couple of days on that one. Uh, let's see. Week 5, week 6, XFL football. Uh, did a, The NBC game actually ended up doing a 2.4, as opposed to a 2.6 that we said yesterday, because I guess what we had was the Fast Nationals. Um, and it's it was slightly up from the week before, uh, so there w it was actually the first time that there was an XFL show where the rating from week to week actually went up. I mean, but by per by percentage, you know, like a hundred, a couple hundredths of a percentage of a point. Um, it was still the third lowest rated show in the history of primetime television. The the uh, UPN was a one one, and the uh, TNN was an 0. 0.6, so the QM was a 4.1. We point. Six. Oh point six, yes. Um, that, now that's oh point six national, so it was it was actually an oh point eight cable rating. Okay. Don't want to mislead anyone, which still don't want to make it look no. like a bad number. <laughs> it's still a bad number. Yeah, I know. Uh, Brian, uh, the ninja was definitely revealed as Tori on Heat. Oh, Got was it? right away? Okay. Oh. Uh, I guess the Harris twins were released by WCW. Is there any chance of them growing their hair and returning to WWF as the Blue Brothers? God, I hope not, but I would not say there's no <laughs> chance because they're friends with the Undertaker. Uh, here's another one from uh, about the same thing. Um, she was unmasked. The commentators acknowledged who she was. The only thing I can come up with is from Kevin Gregg as to why she wasn't mentioned is because, as Dave said, they probably just have a new idea for her because her and Raven don't seem to mix well together. Uh, let's see. Uh, we've got to... Let's see. Uh, not to be too graphic. This isn't graphic. Graphic would be like something really like watching Vince McMahon and Trish. But I think the reason he was charged with first degree was because of his size. He was 12 years old, but he weighed close to 200. And after the first power bomb, there would have been blood or something to tell him that if he was playing, it was time to stop. I think the power bomb was the case in Washington. I don't know that. He yeah, did I didn't hear anything bomb. about a power bomb with Tate. Yeah, I never heard about a power bomb with Tate. Not that you know he shouldn't have known when to stop. Yeah. Um, and, and all that. Well, we actually, I think we're going to have a bunch of calls on this actually about uh, this issue. So, 
Maybe we'll get to them in just a second. Uh, Jerry Lawler was on a local radio show. Um, I think it was probably the Chicago show. Talked about what happened in Tucson the day he left. He said there's more to the situation than meets the eye. He said one of the WWF superstars could have pulled a power play. Uh, the King also said he thought he knew who Vince really was, but now he feels he doesn't. He's not the last person who will ever say that. <laughs> Jerry Lawler thought that Paul Heyman did a better job on his first week than on his second. He was not surprised that the w, what the WF said uh, about him and the cat on television. He was surprised they didn't say more. And he also said... He was surprised that, they didn't say more? Yeah, I, and I'm not I'm not surprised they didn't say Why more. Why would but, that be surprising that they said is what they did? I mean, surprised they didn't say anything at all. Yeah. Um, I guess they felt they had to. Jerry talked about running for mayor of Memphis. Well, that's probably why, because he's talking about running for mayor of Memphis again. He doesn't realize that, you know, he is a great talker, but how anyone who put pictures of his now wife on the Internet, some of the pictures that he put up, and then wants to run for mayor of Memphis? I mean, come on. You know, it's like, I'm not, I'm not you know, he can do whatever he wants. I think he, he put some new ones up, too. I, I, it's like, it's like he, can, he can do whatever he wants, and, and that's fine, but it's like, you're not, who's going to ever, you know, you can't run for mayor. I mean, I'm not, there's no law. I mean, he can. And probably, and he'll get 10% of the vote. But, but I mean, no one's going to, you know, which is actually more than a lot of candidates are going to get. But, <laughs> but come on, you know. Uh, let's see. He also said that his son uh, is a better dancer than he was. Did not say he was a better wrestler. Uh, let's see. What do you think about Hulk Hogan in WrestleMania 17? I don't think he's going to be there. Uh, this is from Chris who goes, I noticed the judges' complete misunderstanding of professional wrestling, too. It was nice to see I was not the only one. If WCW closed tomorrow, who would WF be most interested in? I don't know. I would guess... Uh, Guys you guess expect, Bo like Goldberg? Bill Goldberg, Booker T. Yeah. Um, maybe Billy Kidman. Not I mean, not most. I'm just trying to think. Um, I think sent a lot of the guys board? like uh, O'Hare to the developmental deals. I'm sure they would sign O'Hare. Not put him uh, on he, TV immediately or anything like that. No, no, I'm sure they would send O'Hare to Memphis, uh, maybe Louisville. Um, I'm trying to think who else. A lot of those little guys, boy, they're you know that are that are good workers, you know, or great workers even like Hasayashi. They're they're uh, they're not going to be very lucky. No, they're not. Uh, boy, who else on that on that Who's roster? There? Um, Scott Steiner, I think they'll they'll sign. Yeah, Scott. Uh, Rick, I would say no. Uh, Page, maybe yes, maybe no. It depends on the mood. Um, I mean, it's not. A, I don't think it's a lock. Uh, uh, so I don't know. Go through the roster. Maybe Canyon. Canyon, I think they would sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, Cat, I would say no. Oh, God. Although I wouldn't say 100 percent no, because he's you know he's he's pretty funny. About but, Flair. But, um, as far as some form, I'm sure that they would give him some form of a job if he asked for one. Yeah. There's a role yeah. for him. Oh, there absolutely is a role for him. Yeah. In fact, I I, I would say Flair. They would they would Nash. Uh, you know, everyone in that company says no, but I still believe that they will. Yeah. And I know you think the same way, don't you? I think so. Yes. Uh, it's from Chris. Do you think any of the WF superstars will be looked upon as legends in five or ten years? Um, Hunter. Do you any of the WWF? WWF guys from today, yes. They Hunter some Austin. Now. Hunter Austin Rock. And um, I think Angle will. Some of the other ones might. I mean, like, uh, depending on what they do the rest of their career. But those, I would say, that's pretty Austin, much all. Those guys are a lock. What? Austin. Austin Rock and Hunter and Angle, I think. Ross, are, well, I should, even though he's not a wrestler. Jim Ross, well, Jim Ross already is, I think. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Are there any plans to do best of WCW shows during the proposed shutdown? I think they were actually meeting today about what they were going to do during the shutdown, as far as TV. TV. So, I, I don't know. Uh, be a bunch of one-minute episodes of uh, Best of Nitro. <laughs> uh, this is from Ben Smith. I'm hoping the sale of WCW goes through and that they turn their act around. As a wrestling fan, I'm not looking forward to the industry being controlled by just the WWF. Boy, I'm not either. You know, a lot of people, um, actually, in the last two days, have commented to me about last week's, not the Observer that, that's, well, obviously not this week's Observer, because it's just it's being printed right now, but last week's Observer... Because, like, you know what I mean? I kind of, like, talked about, like, what I think where it's going to be in a year. And I think they kind of saw that, like, wow, you know, that's really is where it's going to be in a year. Yeah. It's, it's not... Especially it's after not, that, uh, that issue you wrote about, uh, was it September of last year or the year before? September 99, right after Eric yep. Bishop got dumped and right before Russo came in. 
God, yeah. that was an awesome issue. Yeah. And it all came true. Yeah, I know. I, you know what was really bad? It was like, and you remember this, like probably six, nine months later, I reprinted it again and put it on the Internet because it was like, okay, you've screwed up the last nine months. Now here's, here's another chance. Read it again. And then they, they did it again. Yeah. And then it got, it, and it got worse. The opposite. The complete they did the opposite. opposite. Yeah. Let's see. Competition is what made the wrestling industry great. Absolutely. And as much as most people don't want to admit it, Bischoff helped make wrestling a lot more popular. I don't think anyone can deny that. I mean, I, I mean, you can hate the guy if you want to hate the guy, you know. But but you can't deny that you know Bischoff was one of the key people, uh, you know, in making wrestling as popular as it became. You know, because um, I can remember 1997 watching Nitro on the West Coast from five to eight. And then flipping over to Raw, watching five hours of entertaining action on Mondays. Now I watch Raw and SmackDown, but I don't have the same excitement I once had when competition was at its peak and each show was trying to top each other. Hopefully WCW can get turned around, but I'm not holding my breath. If they do, it'll be one of the worst. If they do fold, it'll be one of the worst things that can happen for the fans. Yeah, it's my... You know what, though? It, here's something you have to think about. It all depends on what the world and the wrestling world and everything was like when a certain thing happened. I mean, Eric Bischoff was responsible for this boom, and that's great. He was. But that means absolutely nothing in the year 2001. It means nothing. It's like Gorgeous George was Mr. Television 1949 or whatever. Would he do that today? No, because it's a totally different world. I mean, there were so many things in 1996 that Bischoff had going for him that he absolutely did so not have So many now. things. So many things. Like, that's actually what I was writing. That's what I wrote about last week. Was I mean, the, the whole cruiserweight thing was something. You know, I mean, Paul Heyman had brought some of those guys in, but basically for a national audience... You know, a wrestler like Eddie Guerrero, nobody had seen him. Chris Benoit, I mean, he'd been, yeah, he was in WCW a few years earlier, but they didn't know how to push him. But, I mean, that whole story, Rey Mysterio was a phenomenon. You know, you can't do that now. I mean, you could bring in, like, say, Ricky Marvin from Mexico, and people won't take it seriously because they know all those guys get jobbed. The minute they see his size, I mean, you know, I mean, I'm not saying that it's going to be like this forever because you can, you know, there's the re-education, and in enough, with enough time you can convince people of stuff if you promote it right, but... I'm talking about right now, quick fix. There's not, you can't bring in a bunch of foreign guys and, and have great work rate and turn this thing around. You can't, there's, there's nobody, there's none of these legends like a Randy Savage or a Roddy Piper that are sitting on the sidelines a few years past their prime that you can bring back and get big buy rates with a Hulk Hogan. They're not, they don't exist. Yeah. It's like well, all of those things. When they brought the Cruiserweights in in 95 or whatever, not only was it a bunch of new guys, but it was a, it was a new style. And now yes. you can bring guys in, but it's it's going to be the same style. It's just different faces. Yeah. Plus, I mean, the whole thing with uh, not even looking at WCW, but looking at how the WWF was back then. It wasn't like uh, Vince was making $300 million a year and uh, Eric just scooped him. I mean, Vince was, he was really uh Vince was struggling. They, yeah, they, could, they, they, were behind, they were totally behind the times. Yeah. I mean, they were they were That was a the wheel. Hopper they, they, in the, uh, that was that period. I, I mean, it was the thing where, you know, remember, they had no uh, recognition for new stars, and they, they're, you know, I mean, they had all those big slow guys like they always had for 20 years, and people were tired of the big slow guys. I mean, they don't have that. I mean, yeah, what they're competing with now, I mean, WWF has got, you know, I mean, there's, you know, what, there's like five guys in the whole roster, six guys that really aren't good workers, mm -hmm. some number like that. I mean, whatever, there's, maybe there's a few more, but, you know, most of them are. It wasn't like... You go back to that roster that they used to have where, you know, you had a couple of guys who were really good, and then you had, you know, Diesel and Mabel and, you know, all of those kind of guys. And, and they were in main events, Sid Vicious, you know? Yep. Nash versus Mabel at SummerSlam. What were they thinking? <laughs> this is from Mark Smalley, who goes, In the last few days I've been involved in a lot of discussion about what was the greatest tag team match of all time. The four that caused the most discussion are... Uh, All Japan Women, November 26, 1992, Ozaki and Dynamite Kansai against Toyota and Yamada. That was an awesome match. All Japan Women, Dream Slam, the rematch. It's an awesome match. June 9, 1995, Kobashi Masao versus Kawatawe. And d December 1996, uh, World World Tag League Finals, Kawatawe versus Masao and Akiyama. I'm interested in your opinions on these four matches as well as any others you think are on a comparable level. God. You know, you know there are so many of those Misawa and Kobashi versus Kawada and Tawe matches that I saw that were you know, unbelievable, or, or um, even even years earlier with Saruta, and uh, it was Saruta and Tawe against Misawa and Kawada. Um, 
You know, there's just so many. As far as those two women's matches that you mentioned, I mean, they were off the charts. I mean, I, I, I can't pick, like, um, I don't know. I, I, you know, there's one match that when it happened, and I think it won match of the year. So I mean, Brian probably just watched it. Because you just watched all the matches of the year, like, in the last couple of days, right? I haven't watched all of them yet, but I'm getting through them. Okay. Um, I remember, and this is a match which I did not think was the best match of the year, but but I remember when it took place, or actually when it, not when it took place, but when it aired on television, it was uh, Ken Kobashi and Tsuyoshi uh, Kikuchi against Crawford and Furnace, that everyone was just writing me letters. You know, like, this is the greatest tag team match in the history of wrestling. And I didn't think it was, but I was wondering, have you watched that match? No, I haven't watched that one yet. But on okay. a similar vein, I did just watch Hase and Sasaki versus the Steiners, and I want to uh, chastise every person that voted for that for match of the year because that did not age well. That did not hold up to the times because, oh, I don't know. It was, well, it was all if right. You look back at a lot, if you look back at a lot of matches of the year, some hold up and some don't. Yeah, that absolutely did not. Okay. I mean, I haven't watched that match probably in years, but the one thing about what, what, what did so well with that match was is that I think that was the first time there was ever a pay-per-view from the Tokyo Dome. And at that point, you know, the Japanese style was, from in the ring, was way above, you know, way above the American style at that point in time. Yeah. And so it was like, the, you know, it was the first time that, like, the masses in America saw, like, a Japanese, you know, a really great Japanese main event, which at that time, that was a really great match. So it was like the, um, one of those deals where just so many people from the U.S. saw it and you have a bigger U.S. reader base. Yeah. Okay. And 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 it was it was one where we were all the jet, you know, and it was it wasn't necessarily the best match in Japan, but it was probably the best match of that year on American television. Okay. You know. So anyway, we got Jeff Merrick here. Jeff, how are you? Good. How are you guys doing today? Hey. We're doing really really good. Um. Gosh, hey, you hear anything new on WCW? Uh, no. I've been talking to a couple people today. I actually, had a number of people call and ask me that question: What's going on? And I really don't have any answers today. I've heard a million rumors and no, man, same thing we've been hearing for, for, for a while. I mean, I've heard, you know, the sale's gone through and, you know, Eric's just kayfabing everybody. I've heard there's no sale. Eric's going to walk away. I mean, I mean, I'm sure you guys have heard the same thing. Yeah, I've heard, I've heard enough of it that I, I, I don't want to hear anything until someone, like, <laughs> 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 says, okay, this is, this is what it is. Because, I mean, like, last, last night, I mean, I was hearing from WCW wrestlers and, like, every, like, like, it was like an alternating thing. One of them was like the sale is just a formality. It's going to go through in seven or ten days. And the other one was that, like, you know, we heard from Eric's friends, and it's it's like it's re it's not going to happen at all. And 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 who knows what's going to happen to the company? And it's like you know, but no one knew. You know, no one really knew anything though. I mean, I've heard a lot of it from from WWF guys too, who are really concerned. I mean, if the deal doesn't go through, what's going to happen with World Championship Wrestling? Because I mean, the leverage power goes out the window if WCW collapses, and that's it. Not only that. But if you're a lower third of the card WWF guy, you got to know that they're going to bring in, you know, five, six, eight guys, and the yep. lower third guys Absolutely. are going to be in jeopardy. If you're an upper two-thirds guy, I don't think you're in jeopardy right away, but you certainly are when you negotiate your next contract. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of the names that we've heard already, uh, other people that I've, I've, I've talked to already, it's going to be like, yeah, you know, we're interested in Lance Storm, we're interested in Mike Awesome, of course, we're interested in Goldberg. I mean, like, where's the spot on the WWF roster for these guys right now? You know, there's, there's just no, there's like no place. You know, someone's got to go, and it's always obviously going to be those lower end guys. You know, here's the other one too. If if something happens to WCW, it doesn't exist, and they sign up, let's say five, six, eight of those WCW guys or more or, or whatever, you know that all of those guys when they come in are immediately going to be beat. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's not like we're going to get Bill Goldberg run through Hunter. To yeah. set up this big dream match with Austin that can do a big buy rate, even though it can and would. He'll run through Angle. He may not. I don't even know if he'll go through Angle. No way. I don't know. <laughs> Go Goldberg's, Goldberg's an interesting one because, I mean, of all the heat there is between Goldberg and Vince and Hunter right now. And Hunter is probably the most powerful guy in that locker room. If they do bring in someone like Goldberg, if WCW does collapse, it'd be very interesting to see how they, how they book him. Because, like you say, there are a lot of dream matches you can do with Goldberg. But the thing with, the, the thing with Goldberg is, is of, of all those guys, though, Goldberg's the one who initially will draw the biggest buy rates. In fact, correctly done, uh, Goldberg could really up the buy rates of these things. Because if they put Goldberg over real, like 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 WCW did originally, mm -hmm. and have him just plow through people until he gets to Rock and or Austin, those matches will do. You know, they could do WrestleMania buy rates. But to do that, he's got to squash all those guys, and there's going to be, will they let him do that? 
And my oh. gut feeling is probably not. No, my gut feeling is they wouldn't either. I mean, they didn't let anyone else who came over from World Championship Wrestling do that. They didn't let, you know, Giant do that. They didn't let Jericho. They didn't let Benoit. I mean, no one. It's just, it just doesn't happen anymore. Yeah, and, and, and they, they pissed away initial buy rates for Benoit, too. Oh, totally. I mean, and, and you know, it, it, it worked when wrestling was territorial, but now that it's just two big national companies, you can't, you can't do that kind of stuff anymore. And, uh, Jeff, you know, one thing we were talking about a little bit earlier, and we talked about this on your show when I was on a couple a couple days ago. What have you? And we, we've actually, I mean, you know, I've discussed this many times. What are your thoughts of this business one year from today? Uh, it's actually kind of frightening. I mean, when I sort of blue sky, I think, well, WCW is going to be back on track, and you know, uh, Eric and, and Fusion will will stabilize that company, uh, and UFC will be a, a strong third alternative, but. Really, when you look at it realistically, there's I have no reason to believe that WCW is going to turn around at all. Uh, and UFC is a big question mark. The WWF will probably be the only product out there, and without competition, it'll probably be a stale product because, you know, what motivation is there for Vin? Yeah. Uh, this is also a question for you. It says, um, because I know that Trish Stratus co-hosted the law with you, and you know each other, and you're probably good friends. Has she said anything to you about why the storylines are making her look like a complete idiot? To, the, to me, the recent stuff with Vince seems like some sort of perverted joke um, that him and the writers are doing to get back at Trish. Has she pissed people off? She seems like she's a team player looking at it from the outside. Yeah, she's pretty wide-eyed and naive going into the, the World Wrestling Federation. I mean, she always had the, the WWF blinders on. I haven't talked to her in the last couple... Actually, I haven't talked to her in about a month. Um, but I know she... If I know Trish, I know she really, really hated... Uh, the angle she, she's been doing with Vince. Um, she's never, I mean, she's, she's honest about herself and she knows why she's there. I mean, uh, she's not there because, you know, she's, you know, an amazing wrestler or anything. She's there because of her looks and she understands that that's her profile and that's her cachet. Uh, at the same time, she's still a really proud person. Um, and doesn't, I mean, one of the reasons, I mean, she was going to go to World Championship Wrestling originally. I don't know if you guys know that story. Um, at the Mayhem pay-per-view a couple years ago, Vince Russo uh, talked to her and sort of laid out a plan for her. And it was a lot of TNA and stuff like that. And that was one of the main reasons why she didn't go, even though WCW was offering her more money. So I know she can't be thrilled. Um, as far as having heat in the locker room uh, or why they'd be doing this to her, we knew when she came in she'd have, you know, heat with the women. Um, but I I can't imagine that, you know, heat with a few key women, we probably know who those are, too, um, you know, would would uh, would find her, you know, in this angle. I mean, I don't see it as something like uh, Vince is doing this because he's angry at her. I think it's more like Vince is just, he's going crazy. He's just frustrated. That might look really crazy, but he's just so stressed. I, 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 don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't think that her, I think that if it wasn't her, it would have been somebody else. It's not like it's 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 about, I don't think the angle's about her at all. Yeah, well, interesting though that you know it's it's not Deborah, it's not China, it's not anyone that. Well, has it can't be. Sort of, it, it can't be Deborah, Deborah and it can't be China. Oh no, no, I I I understand that from the storyline reasons, but China's behind the scenes reasons. I mean, it's not going to be Austin's <laughs> wife, right? And it's not going to be Hunter's ex. Yeah. So I mean, and, and she's. But it can't, it can't be it can't be China anyway because because it has to be a woman that you know. I mean, China. You know, theoretically, she's a good-looking just... young woman. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it had to be real good looking and young, and, and, and also, you know, China theoretically would belt Vince in the mouth if he tried anything anyway. She couldn't, you know what I mean? Well, she couldn't be portrayed like that. You know what, though, if, they, if, if apparently, you know, Vince and the writers had so much heat with, with Stacey Carter, with Kat, why didn't they book this with her? She'd have done it. Sure. <laughs> so had fun doing it. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> yeah. Um... Maybe they felt that uh, that she would really, you know, you know that whole thing about she's going to turn into Sable. Mm-hmm. I mean, if 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 she could, and if that's true, that she would, that there was, that they were afraid she would turn into Sable, putting her in a main event angle with Vince McMahon, she would turn into Sable. Yeah, I mean, she's thrilled to have that spot. Like, I remember when she first got the spot, where she was first on the ramp with like Shane and Stephanie. I think Vince was out there too. I mean, she was really excited. Like, wow, I'm getting this amazing spot. And then obviously everyone, you know, some key people in the locker room got their backs up. So I know she's kind of torn. It's like, wow, I have this amazing spot on television. I'm out there with Vince. Um, you know, every day I'm a little intimidated. How do I say no? How do I say no to anything? I've been in the company for a year. Yeah, and if she does say no, then she's able again. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, she's caught. She's trapped. She's trapped, yeah. I mean, it, you know, unless she wants to get out of the game. 
I mean, that's, your, that's your choice. Do. Although, you know what, she's always maintained, you know, she signed the one-year, the, uh, the three-year deal, and at the end of three years, that was going to be it for her, but... <laughs> <laughs> We've heard that one before. I was going to say, who have we what? not heard that from? <laughs> I'm, almost I'm almost embarrassed to even say it. Did I send you that whole uh, USA Today online chat, Dave? With no, you only sent me the one the one line about Hunter when they asked him if he what, what, when when the when the person asked him what kind of drugs he uses to get his physique, and he said that he's never done any drugs for his physique. Yeah, but I don't know anything he else. He just died it down after his uh, debut, and now he's just bulking back up. Yeah, I'd wondered about that. Anyway, he also said. Um, I don't want to be one of those wrestlers who stays around too long. Has there ever been? Has there ever been anyone? I mean, has there ever been anyone, ever, who actually walked away from this business in their prime and never walked and never came back, ever? Voluntarily. I mean, as far as like a su as far as a superstar. I mean, a real super. I'm not talking about like you know someone who couldn't get booked anymore. Are you but I mean, like a, like a, a tippy top superstar, or even like a. Because I'm thinking like the only one who probably would have done that would have been Owen Hart. And I, we don't know that he would have done it either. Mm -hmm. he, he, you know, he might. I mean, Brett, Brett was forced out with the injury, and he still, and he still was, you know, not at his peak. You know, he was probably a couple of years past his peak when he did it, when, when that happened. I mean, is there anyone who actually like? I mean, I'm saying like at the age of 35, as opposed to like at the age of like 40, 42. She said, you know, I can't quite do. I mean, I remember Bruno Sammartino's retirement. Uh, the original retirement, he was uh, like 81, so he'd been 40, 45, just maybe right before his 46th birthday. And he was just like, you know, I, I need to get out because I don't want people going, oh, Bruno, you know, remember when Bruno was, was good? And he just goes, I just don't want to be in the ring when people said that. And he did come back, and you know, obviously everyone knows he regrets that he came back about three years later for the, in the David thing. But even then, Bruno was, you know, 45, 46 when he, he did walk away. And, and he was a top guy. I mean, he was really a top guy when he walked away at that age, but that's not walking away at 35. I can't think of anybody. I don't think there has been anybody. Um, yeah, you know, I, I mean, can... the nature of the wrestling business is that you can't. You can't walk yeah, away. Yeah, so seductive. Top. You can't walk away. Yeah. Top. There's, there's, there's always too much money to come back. I mean, and also, there's another one. How many guys have we heard that, you know, Shawn Michaels, just an example that pops into my mind right now. Career-ending injury, absolutely told by the doctors. Paul Orndorff, do not come back. And 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 you know, literally, they always do. Mm -hmm. You know, if they physically can. I mean, you know, I mean, Buddy Cole. I wish you hadn't I mentioned Shawn Michaels and Paul Orndorff in the same sentence, because look what happened to Orndorff. I know. Well, no, he came back many times. I'm talking about like, I'm talking about coming back after that mid-80s thing, where you know, like he hurt his arm, and then he came back, and then he came, you know, he came back the last time. That was obviously, you know, something that that was a bad one. Let's go to John in Florida. John, what's going on? Dave, how are you doing? Doing really good. Listen, I saw something on the Internet. I don't know how true it is, but Dave Apter said, why would Eric Bischoff be on vacation in the middle of negotiations unless Dave he's Apter? celebrating? Dave Apter, doesn't, Dave Apter doesn't exist. I think that's a spoof. Do you think that's possible? That What's possible? He's in Hawaii celebrating. I hope he's celebrating. <laughs> no, that he's, I hope he's not crying right now. Done. What? I mean, I know what he's there for, and I, I hope he's celebrating. He's not there for anything to do with wrestling, though. Where in Hawaii? What part of Hawaii? Uh, that I don't know. <laughs> what you if, I, if I knew, I'd probably know more about what's going on. <laughs> well, why would he be there during negotiations? No, they stopped. He, well, er, actually, actually, Eric Bischoff's not even involved in these negotiations. That's that's the you know Fusion and um, Time Warner executives. Eric, Eric's a creative guy. Eric's not a money guy, which is... Good. <laughs> I mean, that part of it's good. But, but do you think the deal's going to go through? I, I don't want to speculate because it's, it would be really... Even speculating one way or the other would be like leading on that I know more than I do and I don't. I think that there's, there's a possibility that it will. And I mean, I've heard enough evidence on both sides to know that there's a possibility of either. Because so. I already heard it's already done and they're going to do it at Greed. They may. They may. I mean, well, oh, Monday night in... Gainesville, or Monday night, or, or Monday night in uh, what was the other one? Yeah, no, but that's the same thing. Okay, but see, now, now, now you know that that kind of stuff. And I'm not saying it's not true because, as I said, I do not know. But I mean, how many times when ECW was running out the string, you know, there's three shows left that we heard, or five shows left that we heard that on this date or on this pay per view, Paul's going to come in and announce, "I got USA Network and everything is happy." I mean, we, yeah. it's like that's the nature of rumors, and it, it may be, and again, it may be true. But uh, you know, I mean, there's no, you, there's no, there's no, there's no evidence of anything. 
Yeah, what do you think is going to happen at the pay-per-view? Is Ric Flair going to kiss Dusty's ass? Oh, God. Oh, that, that I don't know. Probably. <laughs> Trick Flair, his uh, deal's probably coming due, or he's working without a contract, <laughs> whatever the deal is right now. So. Hey, Dave, I saw your home number on the net, you know. My home number? It's on that's the not, Internet. A... I have it written down. Well, don't That's okay. Me. I mean, my home number's in the Observer every week. <laughs> I think it's on a website, <laughs> It's not a big deal. My card and he said he got some guy Rick. Um, then, then maybe it's the wrong number that's on the internet. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But let me ask you this. Why is Vince McMahon the way he is? <laughs> that's the best question I've ever heard. I've been figuring that out for years. <laughs> do you think he killed I, I, I think it's a product of, I think it's a product of, I think it's a product of his upbringing, seriously. It was an accident. You think so? What makes you say this? Because uh, that's the only answer I could give you. It's, up, uh, her it's heredity envi and environment that no, causes. He's talking the about Owen Hart. He's talking about uh, if Vince killed Owen. Vince didn't kill Owen. Well, let me ask you this. I heard this. <laughs> I heard Owen wanted out of his contract to go with Brett to WCW. Then a couple of weeks later, they tell him go up top, and he's afraid of heights. And then all of a sudden, he falls. Don't you find something fishy there? <laughs> I do not, for one second. For one second, think that Vince McMahon did anything to cause that to happen, or that he's anything but sorry. There's, why would he? You know, he didn't have anything in his own heart. He wouldn't even do that to Bret Hart, although I'm sure he's had thoughts of doing it. <laughs> but he wouldn't do it. I mean, there's one thing that there's a lot of things that Vince McMahon is, and there's a lot of things that he isn't. But uh, that isn't that isn't one of them, and certainly not to Owen Hart. No way, no way. I mean, but he wants it out of his contract. There's been a lot of Owen people Hart? that wanted out of their contracts that he hasn't killed. <laughs> <laughs> and that were, a lot big, that were not nearly as nice people as Owen Hart either. And he, while he did ask, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, how do I say, it wasn't like he demanded and threw a fuss. And just, like, there are guys like, you know, like Kevin Wackholz, although he, it was one out of his contract, but Kevin Wackholz grabbed him and, <laughs> I mean, if he wanted to kill okay. someone... Uh, choked him out, and then you know said that Vince sexually harassed or grabbed him and all this. If, if there was ever anyone who Vince McMahon would probably have good reason to want to like you know send up there and cut the cord, that would be the guy. Certainly not Owen Hart. And um, I was so, just even sure uh, over Owen Hart for crying out loud. Yeah, yeah, and he brought him back twice now. Oh, yeah. I just remember something else. If WCW is gonna fold, why are they signing all the guys they're signing? They're not signing anyone. Jerry Lawler? They haven't signed Jerry. He hasn't signed yet. Not yet, but obviously he's gonna. Well, if you're if you're running a business, you can't like um you know, if if if, if Eric you know, obviously you're gonna talk about the future if there is a future. I mean you if you're in a business, you plan the future until until basically the day you fold. I mean that's yeah. just the nature of a business. Um they're not telling all the employees, you know, it's like if they went in there and just go, Oh, by the way, everybody, you know, we're actually running out of money and we're folding in like two months. Do you know how bad but the TV shows would be for the next two months. Mm -hmm. I mean, I actually, yeah, that's, that's, I shouldn't say anything about that. But uh. I'll tell you though, if, if the deal is done, none of the wrestlers, she's that I've talked to, and there's a whole bunch of those, no one knows about it. Yeah, no one's got. And, and it, 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 it is, you know, I mean, I don't, I don't put it past the possibility that Bischoff wants to announce it on his own time and probably during an angle. You know, if it is done, but I don't, but I don't know that that's true. Well, let me ask you know, you this: What Rick Flair said Monday night that he put. Savage and Hogan, is that a hint? I was afraid of that hint. Well, okay, well, now the angles that they're running, they're running the angles based on the idea that it's going to be sold, yes. I mean, for sure. So I mean, he's that's, gonna, that's, he's the writers don't angle. know if it is. But the writers, the writers, don't, know any, the writers don't know anything either, yeah. That's just Ed Ferrara and Johnny Ace. Trying to but I mean, I'm happen. saying, could that be a hint that these guys are returning? Absolutely, yes. It scared me to death, but yes, I, 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 it's, it's a hint. But everyone, know, everyone knows that that's a possibility. All right, Dave. Although thanks. Piper's a long shot. Anyway, we got to get running, okay? He's gone. Don't call that okay. number, dude. I want to ask you, uh, what's as far as um, what's going on with Off the Record? Uh, off the Record, we're doing uh, three shows this weekend. We're taping them all on Saturday. Um, I'm going to be writing them along with uh, Bob Mackwitz and Michael Landsberg. The first one is going to be uh, Hardy Boys and Lita. It's going to be a three-chair panel. Uh, second one's going to be... Are, are, uh, uh, hold on. Uh, on that one, are you going to be discussing wrestling or is it other subjects? Oh, everything's all about wrestling. Oh, it's going to be all wrestling, okay. All wrestling, yeah. The, the, all three shows are all about wrestling. Um, so Hardy Boys and Lita, 
Um, the second show is going to be an all-Canadian panel. It's going to have uh, Edge Christian, Val, and Chris Jericho. That's going to be like a more sort of uh, State of the Union address for pro wrestling, like a strong sort of wrestling issues show, the Hardy Boys one. I think it's going to be, uh, depending on how we can negotiate it politically, I think it might be talking about backyard wrestling and um, what's next uh, as far as uh, the outrageousness in the ring goes. And the third one's going to be a one-on-one with uh, Kurt Angle. So you did get Kurt Angle. We got Kurt Angle. Originally it was going to be Taker, and then Taker fell through, and then it was going to be Big Show, and then... Thankfully, that fell through, and then uh, they gave us Kurt Angle. You got the best of the three for a good show. Yeah, I know. I was really pleased. I mean, Kurt's got a great story that not a lot of people have heard unless they listen to uh, to Observer Live or our show or, or follow what goes on on the net or follow his, his career closely. That one's going to be kind of a, bi- a biography-based show, sort of get to know Kurt Angle. Um, and, you know, we're going to focus on the other difference between Olympics and, uh, and pro style and Actually, I had someone email me a question today, which is probably a really good one that we'll use on the show, is, um, you know, what are the differences between how political the Olympics is and how you got in there and how That's... political pro wrestling is and sort of what are the differences and do you know who your enemies were or are in both? That's an interesting one. I, I would think, and Brian would know this more than me, but I would think that in sports like gymnastics and figure skating, the politics is probably more similar than, to pro wrestling than a lot of people would admit. But, you know, like a sport like a amateur wrestling or a track, I mean, obviously there's going to be politics and everything. I think that would probably have less. I don't know, Brian, what are you, as far as like gymnastics, I know that's, you know, some sport that you know very well. As far as like the politics of what You know, exactly? like who, make, who makes the team, I mean, as far as... Yeah, well, you know, I mean, a lot I mean, of I mean is, is, isn't your reputation worth a few points? Yeah, things I mean, like that? the way I look at it as far as comparison is, I mean, it's there's actually a lot of comparisons to wrestling just as far as the cosmetic deal, um... You know, just uh, who you train with. Just it, I don't know. It's just like you. We were in, we were talking about that book, the little girls in pretty boxes, and it's like you read that book, and it's almost like reading about wrestling. That's so weird. You bring that up. I got that book right here in front of me. I just started it a couple weeks ago. Really? The fascinating it's a great book. book. Yeah, the Joan Ryan book. Yeah, Joan Ryan book. Yeah, it's awesome, isn't it? Yeah. The thing that the, the thing with the 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 one with the gymnastics though is, I felt that gymnastics was far more scary than wrestling. It, 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 well, you, the reason it is is because it affects um, young girls. It's children. Yeah. yeah. It's not like grown men making their decisions, like, okay, I'm going to put this in my body, or I'm going to look like this, or grown women starving themselves. It's like 12-year-old, 11-year-old girls. So you know, the, 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 the thing, the thing with, with um, I mean, even with the steroids, which, you know, can be dangerous, um, especially if you, you know, get get hooked on them, and then some of the other drugs, and I mean, people have died, and probably people have died, in, you know, at a uh, faster rate in wrestling than, than even in, than in the gymnastics, where you know I mean, they were pointing out, I think I read about two deaths in that whole community that they found in that book over a several year period. But the the nature of of starving yourself to keep your size that small and the whole, I mean, it was you know you know and, and the idea that you know mentally, I mean I I mean the idea of a sport where you peak at fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, and when you're eighteen, you're if you miss that one Olympics, course. you're done. You know, because you're 18 and your body's developed and you're done. I mean, that's just, there's something so scary about reading about that. And the whole thing is, I mean, you can look at certain wrestlers who are in their 40s right now and you can say, man, this guy's been on the juice since he was 18 years old. It's been like 30 years. And, I mean, he's still going. But, I mean, you're talking about doing all this damage to your body when you're still developing and growing. And it just does so much damage. And it's such a a fast rate as compared to, uh, you know, someone that's already... uh, Develop physically like uh, these wrestlers. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then by the time you're 20 years old, you know you're you're a has been, you're, and you're destroyed pretty much for the rest of your life. Yep. You know? to, to, I, to an extent, I mean, from a from because because I mean I know like um, you know one of my best friends, their daughter is competing at a at a pretty high level, and and like some of her friends that that we've had over here are actually like one of them. One of them is actually considering going to Bella Caroli, right? And so I was like, oh boy, you know what I mean? <laughs> you know, I mean, this is after, after, and this is like right after I read that book. And they're going like, yeah, we're going to send her to Bella Caroli, and and it's like, um, you know, because we want her to make the Olympic team. And I go, well, I hope that you know she's not a failure if she fails to make the Olympic team, and she's just doing it because it's what she enjoys. But I'm just really scared when I'm just hearing that name. Was like, oh, it's oh like god, she's too hard for like, life. It's like sending a 12 year old boy to Stu Hart <laughs> to be a pro wrestler. <laughs> oh god. Yeah, but Stu Hart wouldn't have him in the dungeon 12 hours a day, and not let him eat food. Yeah, yeah. exactly. I mean, the food thing, the food thing was more than the, I mean, you know, training's hard, and the fact that they got to train through injuries is hard, but a lot of athletes do that. I mean, you know, 
But the, the, the food thing is what scared me. Having to sneak food and having all... And having to like stay... Like little kids way, plotting how to sneak food into a room around, you know, security guards outside their door. Oh, and then and, also, and, 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 and have like... like you, turning the little kids on their parents as well. I mean, there's that, that's... That's and the parents on each other? Tremendous psychological damage to these kids for years. Yeah. And the parents, you know, so I, I, I mean, the parents want it more than the kids. Because the kids turn into robots that just do what they do because they know it's what they do. But the parents, like, you know, that's their, their existence. You know, that's not and gymnastics. Yeah. You know, yeah. Let's get off of gymnastics because I know they don't want to hear this. <laughs> we can talk about this book on our own time. It is a great book, though. And if those of you who are interested, it, it's a great book. Anyway, um, Guy Who Walked Away, Jack Briscoe. Uh, that's as close as, as I could come to, uh, you know, Jack, Jack was 41 when he walked away, but he he did. <laughs> he really walked away. Yeah. Well, he, uh, one day he was on the road, he told his brother, I'm going home. Yeah. And he never came back. More um, disgusted with the and, WWF? Yeah, it was, it was the early days of the WWF. Um, it says, didn't Mick Foley leave on top? Mick Foley, okay, the thing with Mick Foley was is that he stopped wrestling because he knew that he could no longer perform at that level, even though his last... Or two of his last few matches were unbelievable, but but that's why he did. He, it was it was wasn't a matter of he was on top and he was going to walk away. And he's still in the business, and he's you know he's coming back, although maybe not to wrestle. So I don't know that. Um, I mean, he didn't walk away from the pop. He's just taking a hiatus because um, you know for family reasons. He'll be back to wrestle. Um, let's, let's not kid ourselves. What? I said he'll be back to wrestle. Let's not kid ourselves. I don't know if he's maybe never maybe never full time. I'm sure he'll do it. You know, I, I would expect he'll do a match at some point in you know the next ten years. Sure. It's not, he's not I, I don't know if it'll be on the radio. And he may. He may. You never he's know. Not gonna do 200 house shows a year, but I mean he'll do he'll do key TV match and he'll do pay per view matches and uh, I wouldn't be surprised at all. Yeah. Uh, this is when did the WWF start? Who was the first promoter and how many generations of McMahon have been promoters of the company? Well, the first. 1905. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Jess McMahon, who was the boxing matchmaker at the Garden in like the 20s and 30s, also promoted a lot of pro wrestling, or some pro wrestling. Uh, so he would have been the first McMahon. And then Vince Sr., who was uh, Capital Wrestling, who promoted the Garden uh, from the 50s and the 60s, and actually through 1982, and then Vince Jr. So that's the lineal thing. As far as the, the term World Wide Wrestling Federation started in 1963, um, although the McMahons promoted wrestling, I mean, I, I don't know where Jess, Jess probably started in the 30s, I'm guessing. But um, the term Worldwide Wrestling Federation started in 63 when Buddy Rogers was the NWA champion. It's actually an interesting story. And his, he was being booked by the uh, New York office. He was a big, big draw. And they were get, taking all the plum dates. And basically the other NWA promoters were having a really hard time getting dates on their world champion. And... They, it was kind of well known in wrestling that Vince Senior and uh, Toots Mont, who ran the WWF at that point, um, were wanting to kind of pull Rogers out and pull away. And the NWA uh, was trying their, their game, which was Sam Mushnick's group, and they were all theoretically all um, aligned with each other and all friends. While of course, as they were actually backstabbing each other, you know, and and and. Mushnick's game that he was trying to play was to corner Buddy Rogers and have him drop the title so they could have their, quote, world champion, the NWA world champion, back booked by the NWA, and then those guys could book, you know, whatever they wanted, however they wanted, um, and then they wouldn't have the world champion. So what ended up happening was Rogers kept uh, being in a position where he was supposed to lose the title, and somehow or other he would kept getting injured right before the match. It happened two or three times. So finally the match happened in Toronto with Rogers and um, Luthez. And that was the one where this phrase was not uh, first said, but it was said. Luthes whispered to Buddy Rogers, uh, "We could do it." Actually, what happened was um, there, there was a lot of funny stories with that because the, the champion had to post a twenty-five thousand dollar bond, and the um, so 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 they were going to release his bond and basically, okay, Buddy, if you don't lose the title in the ring to Luthes, you're losing your twenty-five thousand. And um, they basically took the cash, and they go, if you want, you know, I, I forget what it was, but um, if you lose, there was, there was a whole thing. But Buddy actually didn't trust Vince Sr. to hold the cash. He wanted Sam to hold the cash, even though Vince Sr. was his partner. But anyway, Buddy lost the match to Luthez in the ring, and Lou had told him basically when the match started that, you know, we could do it the hard way or the easy way. And Buddy was just like, let's do it the easy way. That's the old, Luthe uh, the old um, Ed Lewis line. Yeah, that's where he got it from, was Ed Lewis and Ed Don George. Well, anyway, so, so Fez, Fez won the title, and what happened was the Northeast promoters just basically pretended the match never took place, which 
This is con would be commonplace now, but in those days, that was a real big deal. They just pretended it didn't take place, and they just basically announced that Buddy Rogers had won a tournament in Rio de Janeiro from uh, Gracie's dad, I guess, and uh, was the Worldwide Wrestling Federation champion. And then Rogers lost to Bruno right away, and Bruno held the title for eight years. So that's basically the, the gist on that. Let's go to uh, Charles in Connecticut. Charles, what's up? Hi, hi, Dave. How you doing? Doing good. Hello? Yes. Right here. Yeah, here. Uh, I didn't get to hear... Uh, it's funny you were talking about Utez and Buddy Rogers. I didn't get to hear uh, uh, the program uh, on Monday with Utez, uh, mm -hmm. and I didn't get a chance to call in, but I did read the transcript of um, um, of the law with Buddy Rogers, or not Buddy Rogers, Utez, and he said that uh, said something about in Toronto he once fought, he beat up Bruno, in a match, and, and uh, I, I sent you this email. I don't know if you answered it or not, but yeah, actually, it was yesterday. Yeah, I did answer it. Yeah, yeah, that was a work match. Yeah, what, what, what that was actually po politics involved. See, the NWA knew, okay, Mushnick and 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 Tunney, Frank Tunney, they 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 were the powers of the NWA along with Jim Barnett, and they knew that that Rogers was going to lose the title to San Martino, and the idea was they had Fez beat Rogers, I think, twice. And then they booked a match with Fez and San Martino. This is before San Martino won the WF title, and then had Fez go over San Martino. So that way, if you know, from this historical standpoint, if people actually, and in those days, that was really, really important. Um, it, it was the big thing. Like when Bruno won the title, it was like, well, you know, right before Bruno won the title, he wrestled. You know, I mean, Fez beat Bruno. Fez beat Rogers. So Fez is the real champion. That was the mentality. Uh, and and Bruno, you know, Bruno did lose that match. So yeah. So that, that was a work match. Oh yeah, of course, of course. I, I got the impression from reading um, um, from the law, from reading about Lutez, that a lot of his matches that he won legitimately, or at least some of his matches he won legitimately. Like, how true is that? No, if we like the claim, I mean, none. Day, I, mean, I mean, I mean, is that just a story you like to tell, or? Um, I'm sure he had matches because it was a different era where, and especially because of who he was, where people tried to test him out. And there was an element of shooting in matches, but as far as like you know, I mean, wrestling was all predetermined after 1915, and Lou didn't start till 37 or 30 or 35, whatever year it was. So, I mean, it was all predetermined wrestling in those days. Now, 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 did he ever get into real scuffles? Absolutely. You know, that happened, and it would it would have happened with him, and that's why he was champion for all those years, was because they trusted that nobody's going to get the better of him in a real scuffle. They trust, you know, I mean, I mean, that, that's that's, you know, it was real. That's why he had the title in the 50s as much for that as also the fact that he was a good performer. I mean, there was always the fear that if you put the championship on someone who couldn't defend themselves, that somebody would double-cross them, because that's what happened in the 20s several times, in the 30s, and embarrass you. So, you know, that, that's one of the reasons, you know, that, that Fez was champion for so many years was because he did have that respect as being real. Or one of the fans could challenge him and beat him up in public, which, you know... Yeah, any, anything, well. yeah. Because he said um, what he was doing back then was closer to UFC than... than than to wrestling, than to, like, WWF right now. So, like, like... It's also in the middle. He said he didn't watch much UFC, so... Yeah, it's, 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 it's in the... I mean, it's like, stylistically, it was closer to wrestling than what they do now. But, I mean, as far as, like, it was no more... I would have to say it was no more of a sport than the now, if you use the same terminology. What they do is it's a different form of sport. Now it's a lot more fast-paced. It's a lot more acrobatic, tumbling... Um, spectacular. That was th that looked more like their form looked more like wrestling, but ultimately it's just a different form of the same. I, I mean, I consider it a different form of the same thing. Was it? Weren't the strength? I heard the strength where Lewis matches like in the twenty were in the twenties were real. No, they weren't. No, no. no. We had no, like I mean, one hour, two hour. No, no, no. The, fi the, the five hour match with Joe Stecker, I'm convinced that that was that was real. Okay, but most of the one hour matches, no, no, they weren't. They always say he was the first one that jobbed, or he's the first one that you know be credited with jobbing. No, no, no. I mean, they, they were, they were that, that stuff happened in the 1880s. I mean, I've read newspaper accounts of, of wrestling stuff from the 1880s where you can read the newspaper account and just go, like, you know, pro wrestling world champion, which means as much as, you know, I mean, it was like you could tell that, like, even then it was all, it was all worked. And, and I think Gotch, Frank Gotch, who, you know, I think most of Frank Gotch's matches were worked up. You know, probably the Hackenschmidt matches were not, but, um, which, which is why they're so legendary. But, you know, they were, you know, they were kind of farces in their own way, but, but, you know, I, I think that the only real pro wrestling, consistently real pro wrestling that there's ever been is probably the stuff that's happened in the last five to seven years with Pancras and, and Rings, real, realistically. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, like, that. You know, that's the only organizations that have promoted 
mainly real ma I mean, Ring was just in the last couple of years real matches, but they, they had some before in Pancras. You know, it was probably 90% real, and now I'm sure it's 100%. You're talking about, like, UFC-type uh, type competitions? It's similar. It's, it's actually now, now, now they've evolved where they're very, very similar. At the beginning, it wasn't quite... It was a different set of rules, but, yeah, but it's real competition, yeah. Okay, but thanks a lot, Dave. Okay, All you're right. very welcome. Bye. Okay, let's go to, is it uh, Scott in Connecticut? Yeah, how you guys doing? Hey. Doing really good. How's it going, Jeff? Hey, Scott, what's going on, man? Uh, what would you guys think of Raw? Of Raw? Yeah. I thought Raw was awesome. Yeah. I thought it was a really good show. Yeah, I thought it had um, three really good matches, the, uh, the Benoit Guerrero and the uh, the main event, and then I also liked uh, Christian and uh, Devon. What about Undertaker and, uh, I'm just teasing. <laughs> no, I, there was a yeah. no, that was good because it never hit the ring. I purposely took a shower <laughs> during that match. So I never got to see it. But, uh, I want to talk about, uh, how you guys are saying, um, about when WCW shuts down, or if it does, how, uh, WWF would swoop up all this talent. And you guys are all saying that, um, I mean, with no competition, it's going to get to be a stale product. But when they have all these guys lined up, like, Steiner and Goldberg and Page, who they can put all these dream matches with. Don't you think it's going to take a while for it to get stale? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, for the short term, for the first six months to a year, it'll be really good. I've yeah, seen this model in action in um, 74 with roller derby, when there were two competing roller derby universes, and then one of them died, and then the other one got all of the good players, and they had these dream games. And, and for a while it was awesome, but somehow or other the lack of competition killed it all, and within... You know, it was it was less than two years before the whole thing like completely died. And I'm not saying the WF will die, but there will be this period, absolutely, for a while where it will be really, really good. But then the lack of competition will make it stale. But the thing is, Dave, it'll only be good if it's booked to be good. I mean, we talked about this earlier in the show. Too. That's true too. You know, if it's if it's Scott Steiner coming in to bury Perry Saturn, or you know Goldberg coming in and and beating up Crash Holly, and that's as high as they go, then forget about it. I really wonder how the mentality will be though, because. Like, for example, the Benoit thing. Yet Benoit coming in as WCW champion, and even though he was under contract to WWF, there was still a WCW organization. So if this guy got some wins, it would be making another organization that actually existed legitimate. Whereas if WCW died, yeah. he would have all these guys under contract, and there would be I no other promotion to legitimize. So yeah, he'd I, I, just do whatever. I don't think the mentality is any different, though, because you're just going back to that same Rome model. Mm -hmm. The first thing that happened in that roller derby thing was that the promotion that lost, which was roller derby, their stars got went into roller games, and the first thing they did was make sure that on every team, the roller game stars were bigger stars than the roller derby stars. For that, even though they owned them all, and roller derby was dead. Yeah. You know, I mean, I, I've never seen in a promotion where the powerful promotion didn't dom didn't dominate the inner promotional thing to where it never reached its potential. Even with New Japan, that knows how to do it. I mean, we just saw the. We just saw it this year with, with Kawada, Kawada yeah. you know, on January 4th with Kawada and Saki. I mean, every every one of us knew that Kawada needed to win that match again for a long term, but he didn't. Yeah. Are the WWF guys that stubborn, though, that they're going to say, oh, I don't want to put over Goldberg, even though that could, that could you know, boost up the, it's not the, guys. the, uh, the pay per view buys for our, uh, our company, it's, you know? It's not, it's not the guys. It's, it's, it's the guy who runs the company. The and, and, he's, and he's very stubborn. You know, and that, uh, to, in, in Vince's mind, and I don't think the fans' minds, but I mean, in Vince's mind, if they, you know, come in and Scott Steiner beats Hunter on television the very next day if WCW shuts down, I think in Vince's mind, that's him saying to the fans that all this time that I've been telling you that WCW is a lame product, I was wrong. I mean, I, I'm not really talking about Scott Steiner, because I mean, in my opinion, Scott Steiner in the last couple of years is, uh, is he's getting Lex Luger-ish. I, I mean, think he tries as hard as he. I think he, I think he tries as hard as he can. I mean, he, I mean, he used to be awesome. I mean, in the, in oh, the early nineties, I remember he. I mean, he, he yeah. used to be really good, but when he started bulking up, I think he bulked up to the point where he can't really move. Oh, no know? question, no question. That's true, but the difference is Luger, I think, has the ability to move, and he does not. Uh... Well, 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 Luger's atrocious, but I mean, but Scott Steiner's just like. I mean, he's got this. His, his look is perfect for a world champion, but I mean, his mic work is just. You know, it, it seems like. I don't know. It just seems like, like he, he stutters and stuff, you know. It's kind of like he doesn't like. He's on phonics on Nitro. Yeah, I mean, he says he says key words in the promo wrong that'll ruin the night. Like he'll say, um, but it's funny. <laughs> he'll go. He'll, he'll be saying, oh, "You're gonna fight him in a ladder match," and he'll say "cage" instead of "ladder." Yeah. Just weird stuff like that, you know. And I, I mean, I, I'm thinking I'm, when I'm talking about like uh, the, the guys that can really do something in WC, I'm thinking Goldberg basically only. 
you know. Uh, if, if they let him, but go, you know, if they if they book Goldberg wrong, I mean, we've all seen Goldberg. Goldberg's got to be so careful because he's not that great, but mm -hmm. he can draw when he's booked well because of, of whatever reason. And and it's a question: Are they going to go in there? I mean, to book Goldberg great, you have to have him go in there and squash everybody in two minutes, and you have to have him squash, you know, the top guys too. And I, I just don't know that they're going to go in there, you know, Goldberg and Hunter, you know, the month before Goldberg challenges Austin, and have Hunter do what he needs. I mean, he may. He may what if you go forward, though, may. like they did in WCW? Like you With start what? off, you start off putting him in there, like, you know, mid-card, and then he, he keeps beating guys, so it's almost like they have to put him in there with the top guys, you know? And yeah, it, but I mean, that, 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 that precludes everybody there laying down for that, that quick match. But, I mean, these guys, I mean... When it comes to like them having a job or not, it's not like they're going to care if they're losing a Goldberg who like was on it's, top. It's of not the, top like top I said again. It's not the guys. Yeah, it's not the guys. It's it's the guy who makes the decision. And is he going to go in there? And, and and in the case of when you get to the top guys, no, I mean it's not the guys in the middle and, and all that because they're going to do what they're told because they have no choice, especially if there's no other organization. But when you get to the Undertaker level, it's not. You know, it's 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 like is Vince going to allow Bill Goldberg to squash the Undertaker in two minutes? Well, does like, he want you know, money? What? Does he want money? I mean, that'll make him money. He doesn't. That that but that's the same. That's the same thing we've had with every interpromotional. The exact same thing. Don't they want the money? Don't they want the money? But somehow, ego gets involved with in in the way of money and and that whole thing. Of we have to prove that we were always better. I mean, what? Why did Hogan never put Flair over? I mean, for money, for Hogan's money, for everyone's money, it would have been the best thing for a long term for a Hogan Flair feud for Flair to actually win one. You know, like I'm not talking at the end when he actually did where Hogan put him over, but I mean, yeah. in the '94 feud and in the '91 feud, you know, Hogan would not put him over. Um, and and and, it's, and the same, you know, and you know, it was it was it was for Hogan's benefit to do it, but that ego thing gets involved. And, and you know, there's also locker room morale as well to take into account. I mean, you've got I mean, if you're bringing if you're marching Gold, Bill Goldberg in, he's gonna say, okay, we're gonna put him over, you know, you're gonna we're gonna put him over Taker. Um, you know, we're, there's mm -hmm. all those guys that have been, you know, done house shows for the past three years that are close to getting to that level where they should be going over Taker, and then you bring someone in from the outside to over Taker, and all those guys are like, oh well, that's my spot. What, if I, what did I put all these guys over for all this time? Why did I go and bump on the road? Why did I make right. all my bookings? Yeah, and, and plus there's that mentality that where you know, like that the WF has, where the stars, where the major leagues. How can you allow a minor leaguer to come in here and beat all of us without paying his dues? You know, the whole thing with paying his look at Kurt Angle, just an example. Kurt Angle was absolutely awesome performer, but when he got that belt and kept it, I mean, there were people whispering. Hey, he's only been in the business for two years. He doesn't deserve it, you know. And, and in fact, to the point where he believed it. He was saying that in his uh, in that uh, conference call. He's like, you know, I consider all these beatings I'm taking paying my dues. And it's like, I think that once you win the WWF title, um, you've pretty much paid your dues. But well, well what about uh, if WCW stops? Is WWF going to think about? I mean, if they expand their roster, they can expand their television too. In what sense? More TV I, mean, guy, I, I, I think that that would be a big mistake. I mean, that means that there's and then they can't, and they can't because there's not enough days of the week. Though their, their guys are their production people and everyone, they're all overrun with work. They're making too many mistakes now. Yeah, I mean, I mean yeah, they, they, they can't, can't, they they can't act like a third show. They could do it the way they used to do it, and you know, pre-tape a lot of the all the shows. I mean, a lot of the shows they have on the weekend, the hour shows, basically just, just recap shows. You know? Yeah. No, 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 I, I can't imagine them doing more, more like live TV, you know, like less, you know. Not I mean, they, they can't add, add a, basically add the third day of TV. I just don't see it. It's just it's, too hard on everyone. Yeah. You know, back the office now. people would never get work done. We do have two more people who did quit uh, at their prime. That's from Chris, who says, "I heard that Hulk Hogan said that he wants to be out of the business in about three years, so he can walk away when he's still in his prime." <laughs> and uh, somebody else said that uh, you forgot Steve McMichael. He walked away from WCW while he was still at his peak. So, I don't anyway. think that was voluntary. <laughs> I don't think he even knows he left. I think it, I think it, our, our problem is, you know, we think of like Peak as like, you know, someone who's like a really good performer and he's at the top of his game is really doing well, but that probably was the best that Mongo was going to do. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I guess technically that's right. I um, want to remind everyone, uh, tomorrow on the show we're going to have Cody Monk of the Dallas Morning News. Also, tonight on uh, HBO's On the Record, not to be confused with Off the Record, Vince McMahon will be on with Bob Costas. Jeff, are you going to be watching that? Uh, nope. Don't get HBO up here. Oh, okay. And I don't get it either. I got I got some friends who are taping it, so I'll eventually see it. Uh, but anyway, we'll, if uh, anyway, I, hopefully we'll have a report up on the website on on that thing. Brian, are you get HBO? No. Okay. Well, then none of us do. Okay. Uh, let's see. I get it. Have, you get well. Al, hey, you I'll can make write it. a report for us. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Let us know. tomorrow on the show. We'll be now. talking to Al about about that thing. You got this it. thing. This is from Elliot Jenrad who goes, I don't think you can name 
uh, Kikuchi and Kobashi against Crawford and Furnace among the greatest tag team matches of all time ever because only 11 minutes of the match aired on television and it was never released on commercial tape in its entirety. I would say the 11 minutes that aired were on par with any other 11-minute segment of any other wrestling match you'll ever see. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty awesome. What was shown was incredible in terms of crowd heat and pure tag team wrestling, but it's impossible to say the match ranks among the best ever matches unless you've seen the entire match. And he goes, I would rank Hanson and DiBiase against Choshu and Yatsu from the All Japan Tag Team Tournament Finals in 1985 among the, uh, uh, with the four matches previously named. There are so many great matches that, like, you know when people ask the greatest match, I mean, I could go through and probably name, you know, if I looked at, like, match of the year things and start going, oh, I remember that one, I remember that. There's so many of them. Um, in fact, in that, uh, what was it, the, the greatest matches of the decade and things like that that they did on DeathValleyDriver.com, you know, I was looking at that, and it's like, you know, how do you pick, like, one better than the other? These are all, like, really, really good. Uh, let's see. This is for Jeff Merrick. I listen to the law every weekend. I know you were at Casey's Restaurant on Monday night. What was the reaction from the crowd when Vince said he was going to deliver a Hollywood sex scene? Uh, same thing apparently is what happened on Monday night. Everyone sort of jaw dropped and it was kind of like, oh, not again. Uh, you know, we didn't like it the first time and, you know, how much worse can it get? Okay, let's see what else we have here. Uh, let's see, uh, we're on, on the sale. Uh, this is someone who's suggesting that, uh, if the sale falls through and the things shut down, that Bischoff. Uh, could start a company up, which very well may happen, but it also makes all the wrestlers free agents. Um, there's a ch as far as like the, basically he's saying like if, if that were to happen, do you think that there's actually a chance that that let's say the sale goes through, WCW folds, the Bischoff and Fusion would start their own company from scratch? And I say yes, there is absolutely the chance that that will happen. Uh, let's see. I keep hearing comments about the prevalence of steroids in wrestling. Can a person achieve the look of some of the top WF superstars without the use of steroids? Um, With it depends their own on superstar. If you're talking about, you could you could absolutely look like Dean Malenko without taking steroids. <laughs> no, no, I mean, but there's other guys. I mean, as far as some of the other guys, uh, with the, with their road schedule, no. Some of the you know the, the real extreme muscular ones, even with great. I think I think about, I don't know who, who. Let's see, Jeff. Who would you say as, as far as like a guy, who's who's probably who's I, I, of all the guys, you know, everyone who comes on the show, when we, when we bring up steroids, they all talk about it like it happens, and they all say they don't do it. Okay, but uh, maybe it I'm happens, completely stupid. Okay, oh, well, I know that. We talk about that all the time. Okay, but as far as, like, the one guy who I absolutely believe has never done steroids, and there's no reason I should believe him any more than anyone else, but I do, it goes, also because he's an honest guy, it's Lance Storm. Lance Storm the only guy I can say that I believe 100% when he tells me he's never taken a steroid in his life. I believe him, too. He's the only guy I know. Just from, I mean, I'm, I've been... No, no, I believe, I would believe Mick Foley, too, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, from, from, like, the guys that you'd look at their bodies and say, you know what, that guy, that guy's on the gas. I mean, he's right. the only guy. I mean, he's, like, actually, you know, neurotic about the way he eats, um, how he lives, what he does. I mean, doesn't go into a bar, doesn't have any, you know, dressing on his salad, like, nothing. It's, like, everything. He's just, like, so fixated on having this, like, natural body. He says that... You know, it, it it helps him heal faster. It's it's a lot easier for him to uh, to watch his diet and get his sleep and and sort of live a clean life uh, as opposed to you know going out and, and and working the road really hard and compensating you know for grogginess or pain with with pills. Well, the one thing the one thing as far as the sleep goes is uh, you know from people who I know that have been on and off steroids is that that it it, it messes you up because you don't you know it wires you and stuff. Mm -hmm. So that. You know, he's right when it comes to like getting regular sleep and everything. Not being on it probably is probably very beneficial. But I'd say like if you look at Lance Storm, I would say anyone who has a significantly more what, you, what I would call impressive physique than Lance Storm, I would say no way. If you get a guy up to the level of a Lance, I would say Lance Storm is probably about because Lance Storm has very very good genetics. I mean, you can tell by you know his hips and sh big shoulders and everything like that. You know, big muscle bellies in his bicep and everything. Th that Lance Storm is is pretty genetically gifted. And, and the fact is, in, in, for a guy who's on the road and everything, you could get a physique like Lance Storm with the right genetics and not taking steroids because I think he's living proof of it. But it's when you not get easy. Pat, what? It's not easy. Oh, it's it's, it's but yeah, you got to do everything perfect, like Jeff just said. I mean, no, you know, no dressing on your salad, getting the right food. You don't, you can't miss work. You can't miss workouts. The point you is, can't you think about how many wrestlers that uh, look somewhat like Lance Storm are really willing to do that. And actually, do do that. Almost not. Well, that's why we. That's yeah. So 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 yeah. I mean, it's obviously it's problem. Let's go to let's go to Nick in Florida. Nick. 
Hey, I just wanted to talk for a moment about why that particular, that kid down here was actually charged with first-degree murder. There's more than one way to get a first-degree murder charge. It doesn't have to be premeditation. If you kill somebody while you're committing a felony, uh, just sort of randomly, like uh, you go and you pull a gun and you rob somebody and you shoot them and kill them as part of the robbery, the robbery is a felony, therefore the murder or the, the killing that goes with it is always first-degree murder. The kid was charged with child abuse. Child abuse was the felony. So the fact that the victim of the child abuse died made it automatically first-degree murder. It didn't matter what his, what his intentions were. Okay. Okay. Is it like that for, for every state in, uh, in the U.S., guys? Do you know? I, I know. know it's like that in New York. Uh, I don't know about other states, but I think most of them have a similar law. Because in Canada, I mean, it really needs to be premeditated. Like, you know, you think about it, you stew about it for a day, and then you go and do it. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Anything else, Nick, as far as that case? Uh, other than the fact that, you know, it's uh, been all, it's been all the news down here, and uh, no one quite quite knows what to make of it. Hmm. Everyone, 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 everyone that I talked to in Canada about this case is like, how can you charge a you know, a fourteen year old kid who was I guess eleven or twelve when he did this act, did this for for first degree murder? Like, how do you form a thought in your brain that you actually want to kill and, someone? When and again, the the difference there is that they're confusing first degree murder with premeditated murder. Right. It you know it it it's considered first degree down here because you thought that you were going to go and commit some other crime that's that that you know that's felony yeah okay okay all right thanks okay thank you very much uh let's go to mitch in california mitch what's up hey what's going on guys hey i'm stoked for not calling in the last five minutes uh sorry i'm always uh rambling you guys on as you're trying to end the show well actually we got plenty of time now well, right on what one of the things I want to talk about was, Dave, I remember, like, in the late 80s, you had these great, long series about, you know, how to turn Ric Flair babyface. And I, and one, I just kind of wanted to hear one of them, because it's, it's been a long time, and I, totally, I don't totally remember, uh, and, and the kind of people that I, that I know don't remember either. And, uh, and also, you know, if you were booking kind of the top guys, you know, right now for the WWF, you know, what would you, how would you run it right now? That is so complicated. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't like I did that stuff off the top of my head. I mean, I would think it. I would think and think, and 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 <laughs> I would think and think before I wrote. Um, and with with the stuff that's been going on in wrestling, I mean, so much of it has been stuff that just you know the, the booking itself is 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 not as important as it. I, I'm not saying it's not important, but it's the the important issues in wrestling are like funding of companies and things like that, rather than. Um, in, in those days, it just seemed like, you know, you get the right angle with the right person in the right spot and you do business. Now, it's, it's, it's really harder because everyone's seen so many angles. Then as long as you did a good angle, you could do it now. I don't know. You know, angles are, angles are, are a lot tougher to like actually make a difference in business. Now it's more, I mean, Cornette actually said it best, you know, before, when he was running Smoky Mountain, it was, Angle oriented, you could have big stars, but if you had the right angle, you would draw a bigger crowd. Now it's not angle oriented, it's personality oriented. If you have the right personality that's making the appearance at your show, that means more than actually peaking an angle. Mm -hmm. Do you think, uh, and, and another question is just, you know, I remember hearing about like in the 80s, you would always get booking uh, applications for the WWF and stuff like that. And, and uh, you know, what other, what other offers did you get and, and why didn't you? I never got a, I never have ever gotten a booking offer from the WWF. Really? Never once, no, no. Well, no, you, you know how true. the rumors fly. No, I mean, I, I, I never have. There are, I'm not going to say it. But, anyway, but I never have, okay? Okay. Uh, I mean, oh. there, there are things that have been said to me, but, I mean, to even say I was, I mean, I have been asked by the WWF or by people in the WWF, like, ideas for, for people or as far as for people who could help them at certain points. Or even with them suggesting people, um, you know, that that might help them that I would know. But as far as like, I, I have never gotten an offer in that regard from WWF. No. And I, I was also wondering. Remember when Jeff Jarrett jumped back from WCW to WWF just a couple years ago? Probably more than that. Probably like I think it was '97. I think, and he came out and he did that. He did a pretty good promo, um, kind of that you know 
that was kind of shooting on all the top guys, and and uh, I think he had like his hair slicked back, and I don't know. I was I was actually totally amped on it, and if they. I don't know, what do you think they could have done with him instead of sticking him to mid-card, though? I mean, I'm somewhat of a Jeff Jarrett fan. They, tr and they tried and they gave up. They could. Yeah. Yeah, they, they, try they tried. Jeff Jarrett talked. And, you know, Jeff Jarrett, when he came back, he talked his way into the idea that he was going to be a top guy, and obviously Vince paid him what at the time was pretty close to top guy money. Huh. But Vince was convinced, too, that it was, you know, he's whatever age he was, like 30 years old, 13 years experience, whatever the numbers were. You know, he was a veteran, but he was still young. And he had a decent physique, and he could talk, and, and all, all the experience, and he was good, you know, a smart worker. But the problem was he didn't have main event charisma. And you know, Vince tried, Vince gave up, hmm. and the only time it ever really worked, I mean, the only time it ever really worked in WWF with, with Jarrett was once when they put him with Deborah as the tag team with Owen. That was a, an effective tag team, and also at the very end when he was beating up women, which was the right thing at the right time that pretty much anyone would have gotten overdoing just because of the misogynistic nature of the crowd. Right. Yeah, I felt I, I did put on Nitro just for a second the other night, and I just I have a hard time even trying to watch it because just seeing him and Flair sitting together, who are like Flair, obviously is my all-time favorite, and I, and I, I just have a hard time watching him these days. Um, and him and him and Jared together, and I just see Jared with so much potential. And uh, I mean, I, he, I I enjoyed Jared even in the you know when WCW really started taking a dive in the last year. Um, and I don't know, it just it just really bummed me out, you know. And I remember in like I think it was you know just before that pay per view where Austin, I think it was in North Carolina, Austin fought Foley for the first time. It was rumored that Flair was going to show up. Oh, and, the Greensboro. Uh, I don't know. I just I just yeah. kind of wish in my mind I have this movie or this book for Ric Flair's life, and I just wish that somehow it could end with him kind of on top. I mean, the last few years have just been really depressing mm -hmm. to watch him. I wish, I wish too, I wish, I wish a few years ago that he would have gone to the WWF, gotten one big run with Rock or Austin, yep. but it didn't happen. I know. You know, he, he, chose to, he chose to stay. I mean, he fought. You know, there was a period where he was fighting and fighting to get out of his contract. Right, I remember that. And then when push came to shove, he stayed. Mm -hmm. He spent two hundred thousand dollars to get out of a contract that he voluntarily stayed. To, you know, that, that he stayed because Bischoff talked him into staying at the end. And at this point, there's no. I, I mean, how long is he contracted? To, or of course, if WCW folded, I mean, would WWF even have any interest in him? Or at this point, would he just be more like a commissioner type role? I, I think they would hire him, but I, I cannot imagine them putting him on top. I really no. can't. You know, I mean, I, as far as like you know, for a big time program, I mean, maybe a program with Vince, but not with anybody else. I know that there's interest. I mean, Vince and, and Ric Flair. I mean, have, have been friends for a number of a number of years, uh, and there has been talk about bringing him in before. I think the last thing that we heard was when the Radicals came in, they're dying for someone, you know, to hold the stick for him. He was one of the names. Him and Arn were a couple of names hmm. were bandied about. That would have been phenomenal. Well, it's been funny you bring up the Radicals because I feel like WCW is all based on factions, right? And and they go quickly, and they, they, you know, I don't know, it's just always a faction. And right now, WWF is not really faction-based. And i got to say that one of my favorite times to watch wrestling was that summer where there was the Canadians, there was DX, and then there was the Nation. The and Marine I kind of miss it. I mean, the WWF because I knew you were going to say that, Brian. <laughs> I, know, I know that sounds lame, but, I mean, I enjoyed that. And when they had that street fight and stuff, I mean, I don't know, just for just for kind of camp value, I, I just thought it, I thought it was just kind of fun. And now... All the factions don't even like materialize or last long. I mean, I remember just a few months back, if you guys remember, they had Big Show, Shane, and Chris Benoit and Angle as a faction for like two weeks, and then where did that go? Yeah, and they were going to throw Agent Christian in there. Yeah, a um, couple of questions here for Jeff. I knew we were going to get through the show without questions for Jeff on Wrestling with Shadows. Uh, let me see where we got them. We got two of them. Do you think? It's for you, Jeff. Do you think Shawn Michaels was crying because he had conspired to screw Brett, or he was crying because he was unwitting participant in the screw job and thought he was going to be blamed? I think it was a little bit of both. My gut feeling is, is that Shawn... Oh, 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 it had to be one or the other. <laughs> <laughs> did he conspire or not? I think that he... Obviously, he did know about it, but I didn't know that... He had to have been in on it. This is my gut feeling. Yeah, he had to have, he had to have been in on it, but I don't think he knew how serious it was. Well, I think that it wasn't until the moment that the bell finally rang and, and they, they threw the title on him and told him to get to the back, and he saw... And all hell was breaking back, loose. That he, that, at, at that point, that he knew the, sort of the, the depth of the situation, and I think he kind of got scared. That's probably... You know what? That's probably as best an explanation as I've heard on that. You know, in, in that... Because, you know, when you're doing this, 
thing. If you're involved in this to a very small degree, let's just say he sort of was hinted, okay, this was going to happen. You, you know, you really don't know it's going to turn into like this, the biggest news story of 20 years, if you know what I'm saying. No, and then he gets backstage and, you know, there's Undertaker pounding on Vince McMahon's door with 20 wrestlers behind him saying, we demand an explanation or we're all going to walk. Yeah, everybody's saying they're going to quit, yeah. Yeah, and, and you're Shawn Michaels, and you're holding the title, hey, guys, what's going on? <laughs> it's like I was part of this, guys. <laughs> oh, my God. The other question is, is like, whatever happened to all that footage that, that didn't make the movie from that's Montreal? You know what, that's an excellent question. Uh, it's too bad that High Road Productions um, went out of business, because there was a ton of footage, and I mean, a lot of it I saw, and a lot of it I heard. They have a ton of audio from backstage, and it's amazing. And um, we should really get in touch with Paul J to see if they if they could release that or somehow make that available. But the fo the, the audio footage of Sean sobbing and the audio footage of Undertaker banging on McMahon's door was really compelling and actually really frightening. But I mean, who knows? I mean, High Road Productions you know went out of business uh, shortly after the Owen movie. Can you explain it because I think um, no one knows that story hardly because I barely I mean I barely had heard it. But uh, explain basically what happened with with High Road Productions. They did the Brett movie. The Owen movie, they were actually going to do a Goldberg movie as well. Yeah, there was a couple movies they were talking about. I um, I worked on the, I did the research and, and part of the writing for the uh, the Owen Hart movie, and then after I was talking with Sally Blake and she said, yeah, we're really excited about this. You know, we hope the Owen movie will do as well as the uh, as the Wrestling with Shadows, which I kind of knew it wouldn't because you didn't have that. I mean, you had a a, a, a real, you know, I had a real downer story at the same time, but it wasn't as it wouldn't grip as many people as it as, as Wrestling with Shadows did. And so they were planning on, I guess because they went and talked to a lot of people in World Championship Wrestling, and they talked to Hogan, they talked to you know, Ben while, while he was there, while they're doing the Owen, while they're doing the Owen movie, because WWF wouldn't allow you know, High Road to do anything more with them after Wrestling with Shadows came out. <laughs> and I guess they talked to Goldberg, and Goldberg was interested in doing something similar. And then obviously Hogan, once he saw the success of Wrestling with Shadows, said, you know what, i got to get me one of these. Look what it's done <laughs> for Brad. So I mean, right away Hogan was... Was, uh, <laughs> look, look what he did for Brett. Hogan had to take the guy off TV the whole time that movie was on. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, I mean, Hogan wanted a piece of that, too, because he saw what an amazing piece of marketing this thing was for, for Bret Hart. Yeah. He, he did see what an amazing piece it was, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. This is from Elliot and Red, who goes, I was reading um, Luthes' book. He said he was in the main event on the first show that did a $100,000 house. I was wondering what was the first show that did a million-dollar house. I would think that would be Ali and Inoki from um, 76 at uh, Budokan. Um, yeah, at Budokan because they had those super, super high ticket prices, like $2,500 or whatever it was at, at that time, or maybe a $1,000 ringside. Um, so I think that would be the first million as far as ever. As far as the States, first million would have been, um, would have been WrestleMania, the Hogan and Andre in 87. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see what we got here. Uh, is Kurt Angle going to wrestle Benoit WrestleMania? Jeff, this is actually for you, and you uh, probably know better I, than me. I heard that idea pitched around uh, two weeks ago, um, but then yeah, I just got a revised sheet for the uh, for the uh, Air Canada show this uh, this weekend. And they've got Angle in there with Billy Gunn. Oh my God! Yeah. That will not be a WrestleMania match. So <laughs> fingers crossed that will not be a WrestleMania match. But I mean, I, I heard the name Benoit pitched around, but I mean, they've only got a couple weeks to to shoot an Angle that justifies this. Yeah, yeah, they better. I, I, I don't know. I guess we'll try to find out because I was under the impression the whole card was going to be finalized on Monday, and um, I'm going to try to find out what it is in the next couple of days. So I heard either I heard either Benoit with Angle or Benoit with uh, Eddie Guerrero, but I guess they already got rid of Eddie Guerrero on Monday. That's what it seemed like to me when when I saw that when I saw that that finish. I thought that they had made the decision to go with Benoit and Angle, especially because Angle's like they didn't really program anyone else with Angle yet. Yeah, mm -hmm. Angle's got no one. Yeah, yeah but and, then and they, they wanted Jericho's got no one. <laughs> Jericho's going to go with Regal, I heard. What's that? Jericho will go with Regal, though. You heard Regal? I heard Eddie Guerrero. Jericho, well, they, they, they could do that. Jericho and Regal on Monday. But they did something to set up uh, Jericho and Eddie Guerrero, I think. Uh, they on may have Smackdown? done that um, at SmackDown, yeah. The week yeah. before, yeah. It could be either one, yeah. Uh, see, this is a couple of... Uh, didn't Tom Zink leave and never come back? Yeah, that's because nobody... It's not the same thing. <laughs> We're talking voluntary here. <laughs> We're talking about someone, a tippy-top guy... Just going like I'm 35 years old and I'm not a, and I'm going to start declining, so I'm going to walk away. It's not someone who, you know, for whatever reason, there was no job left to get. You know, not that Tom Zinn couldn't have gotten a job working indies, which he could have done and he didn't want to, because he did walk away from that. But I mean, talking about you know, a guy like in the WWF main events, like like let's say Sean had he not been injured, 
you know, like, if he would have, like, walked away and, uh, you know, like, after that WrestleMania, just go, I'm 33 years old, my body hurts. It's sort of like what he did with Sid. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Remember that? he lost a smile. Yeah, but, they, but even then, that was because of injuries, and he was back in six weeks, and all of a sudden, his knees were amazing. And his smile. <laughs> and then when he came back after he'd um, lost his smile, and uh, he came back and he was cutting his promo with Vince, and he gets in the ring, the first thing he does is climb to the top rope, do a backflip, land on his feet. Uh, oh, oh, oh my God, I remember, I remember watching that going like, I wouldn't allow that to do that on my knees, and I didn't go and sit, and I wasn't crying that you know, oh, I'll never be able to wrestle again six weeks ago. Yep. He didn't even have him taped, and then like the whole thing, he went to the. I remember like uh, some, one of the wrestlers like actually called me like about a week after the smile thing, right? It was one of the WF guys, and it wasn't one who didn't who hated him, by the way. It was, but anyway, and they just go, you know, he, he do you hear he went to Andrews, and I go, yeah, he goes. Yeah, he's not getting surgery. And it's like it's like half the guys in this I company need surgery on their knees. Andrew's examined him. He goes, you know, your knees are your knees are damaged. You know, it's like, well, of course. You know, he's been wrestling for 15 years now, or whatever it was. And it's like, but you don't need surgery. And they're just like going, like, oh my god, what you know, what a what a con that was. Uh, let's see. This is from Donald Cleveland, who goes about the Lionel Tate issue. The boy does not deserve life. However, his mother was char who was charged with Tiffany's care, but was sleeping, does. How she took the responsibility to care for an infant and then left the actual care to, to the minor is an issue here. Why wasn't she prosecuted? How could she sleep through the screaming? Or, and this is the real question, did she? Did she reject the plea to absolve her own guilt? I think she did. The whole thing is terrible. Jailed the mother for three years and the boy for three with treatment. Uh, don't know. Uh, she was never charged. Um, so that's all I can say. Let's go to Richard in Toronto. Richard. Hello? Yeah. Hello? Hey there. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Jeff? Hey, Richard. Yeah, okay. Why did you say the thing about the, uh, the, um, uh, the well pay-per-view that they didn't have any ring, uh, psychology? What was, give me an example of that. Give you an example of the <laughs> lack of ring psychology? Yeah, but you, guys, you called it the one of the worst pay-per-views. Dan Lebransky called it Plan 9, um, Unleashed. So uh, why was it called, uh, why did you say there was no ring philosophy? They're only been in the thing for eight months. You know, this is, they're not experienced people, you know. They're not the indie-type wrestlers. How do you expect them to do, do uh, learn so quickly? What do you have pay-per-view for, then? Why do you have pay-per-view? Because uh, wh why I never see it. How okay, can okay, we ever okay, see right, a Japanese women wrestling? That's enough. Let's go to Al. <laughs> what did you cut off for? He was good. Hi, Dave, good. Jeff, and Brian. Hey. Hey, how you doing? Um, here here in St. Louis, where we don't have a UPN affiliate, the WB shows um, SmackDown on Saturday, and whenever the Blues are playing, they air it at 7 o'clock, the same time the XFL is going on. I'd like to know, does the WWF know about that? I'm sure they do, but they can't, they can't, you know, they can't control things. I think that whenever they would the probably Whenever the Blues be... aren't playing? The Blues, that's the hockey team. Okay. <laughs> oh, that God, totally Frank. confused me. It's like, I keep it's like forgetting that you don't know anything band. about sports. Wait, I can play the blues. Oh, I'm sorry. That's, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I was talking about. Yeah. And uh, sometimes, uh, sometimes during the SmackDown show, they've got like the XFL commercials going on, and I'm like, what's the point of this? Because I can't yeah. watch, you know, since I don't have picture in picture on my TV, well, I can't watch the I mean, two shows at the same time. Well, you know, he he goes he goes head up with the, the UPN XFL too. It, oh, okay. You know, he kills he, it. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. No, okay. not by that much. You, he's only doing one nine, so. Okay. Yeah, and my other question is, um, I think like the best time WCW had like was this past summer when Lance Storm went on a run to win all the titles. Um, well, what did you think about that angle? Um, I, I thought it was awesome pretty good in getting Lance Lance over, and obviously Kevin Nash did too. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so that was it for Lance after that happened. Okay. It was funny, the, the story goes, you know, like Kevin Nash kind of walked to the building that day and said, so, what are we doing today? It's like, <laughs> well, you're burying Lance Storm. And he's, I, don't think he's, I think he's got a clean tap. I think, I think it was like four or five, maybe even as much as six months until he got a clean tap again on television. Oh, well, I think that's a shame because, I mean, in my first opinion, I think, you know, they should do that run again because, like, all the websites said that, you know, that was probably, like, the best time WCW had because I remember the, review, the reviews just shot up when Lance Storm went on, went on that run. Mm -hmm. I, well, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that it was even a good time. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was necessarily a good time, but they did. They were effective in getting him over for for a little while until they decided that it was working too well and kind of kind of killed it. You know the um, 
You know what was so funny was like afterwards people trying to, you know, like, you know, like, cause, cause it's like here's this guy who's finally, you know, breaking through a little bit, and then they just kill him dead. And then the justification was like, well, he's going to get his comeback on Nash, and I'm just thinking like, yes, I'm sure. Mm-hmm. And, and you know, it made him more of a star because he got a rub from Nash, and it's like, yeah. I mean, it's like, I mean, did they really... And it's just like, oh, it's like those 70s yeah. job guys got the rubs from being in there with the big A-level talent. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, well, uh, who was booking the shows when Lance was on that run? Johnny I think that was Russo, wasn't it? I think it was so, Johnny Ace because they did that one tournament when he won the uh, U.S. title. That Remember they had the one-night tournament? tournament? Yeah, that was Johnny Ace's tournament. Okay. Yeah. And okay, one last question. Now, how long do you think it will be before Bischoff realizes that Hogan and Nash are killing his company? Oh, Maybe when it dies a second time? I think oh, at I some just, level he must know. I think he knows as, as Booker Nash ruined it, but I don't know. I think as a performer, I think that he's still like with this idea that they are stars uh-huh. because they were stars. And the problem with his business is it's, it's an entertainment business. Where you know star, stardom is weird and fleeting, and someone who's a superstar two years ago may be absolutely dead two years later. And in fact, you know, then, then, then they may be two of the two prime cases of that. I understand. Okay, well, thanks, guys. Thank you a lot. Okay, thank you very much. We are totally out of time, and I want to thank Jeff for joining us. And Jeff will be talking to you again on uh, Saturday and Sunday. Jeff, real yeah. quick, who do you have as guest this weekend? Uh, Saturday, we've got China uh, from the World Wrestling Federation. Unbelievable! Oh, which will be interesting, and. Um, Sunday we've got uh, Gene Kaniski. Wow. I, I want to tell you that uh, I am very curious about both those guests. <laughs> but China, will be, China going, won't be live because I, I think the callers will be merciless with her. Uh, we're doing yeah. a free tape of that on, uh, on Friday morning. Aww. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's too bad, but uh, Kaniski is going to be fun. I'm saying that very sarcastically, too. <laughs> Tomorrow we're going to have uh, Cody Monk on, and uh, actually we don't have a guest on Friday now. And hopefully we'll find out a little bit more about about all that. And we will see you, and hopefully more about the sale as well. We'll see you all tomorrow at 5.